Hey folks, this is Sasan from Proteus Debate Academy. I just recorded like 20 minutes of this and then accidentally hit a button and uh, now it's gone. Um, how's it going? We're doing a LD, there it is. We're doing an LD round. Um, <laughs> gonna have to repeat a lot of this spiel again, but that's okay. I always talk too much anyway, so now I can just stick to the stuff that matters. We got this request from somebody on Reddit. We do a lot of round analysis videos. We used to at least. And um, I have a lot more free time now. My setup is all kind of set. I moved across the country so now I can finally do these again. Um, already got another request for one. So if there's another round you want us to see, uh, want to see us um, do one of these analyses on, I'm happy to do that. Um, this is the 2019 NSDA Lincoln Douglas Finals. For those of you who aren't familiar with like that um, venue, I guess, uh, the debate happens in front of a large audience. It's one of the only like times where debates in high school actually resemble the way every beginning debater kind of expects it to, where it's you want a stage with a big audience in front of you. Um, and the style and whatever leans a lot more, um, traditional. And I'm going to point out, you know, what that looks like and where it happens and why things are done the way they are. So the goal of these analyses is to explain certain concepts um, maybe like if somebody says uh, this, this debate should be very like slow and, um, intelligible, right? Not just in the way people are speaking, but the, the, the complicatedness and the jargoniness of the language being used. So you should be able to follow it, even if you're a beginning debater or not a debater. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give you some perspective on like what each side of the debate has to take into consideration, maybe what some of the strategy behind the things that are being said are, whether something, what, what they're trying to do, whether they're succeeding in what they're trying to do. Uh, I might tell you which side I would vote for. Uh, one brief addendum before I get into that. Um, I don't know who these debaters are. I don't know their names, unfortunately. But making it to the final round of the NSDA National Championships is a massive accomplishment that um, in the many thousands of people who debate at some level, very, very few ever get to reach this level. So first, like even if I'm giving some sort of negative um, feedback, um, what what each of these students has accomplished is monumental and it speaks to years and years of very hard work that um, are difficult to imagine if you haven't done it yourself. And I don't know that um, I have. I don't know that I've worked at, at debate as, as hard as they have. So uh, they have all of my respect. Um, yeah, I guess before I... In case you don't know who we are, we're the Proteus Debate Academy. We make high-quality coaching resources for people who want to coach debate but don't have a lot of experience or they want, I don't know, like just our perspective on stuff. Or if you're a debater who doesn't have a very experienced coach, um, we have a lot of videos. And um, you should just let us know what you want us to make, everything we do will always be free. We don't make any money from this. The downside is that we have these long, what's the, what's the plural of hiatus? Hiati? Sometimes we go a while without making a video just because we're very busy with work, but I have a little bit, I'm kind of on spring break. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I know pretty much as soon as he starts speaking, I'm going to pause and talk for a while because I already did the first I, got, I only got like one minute into the debate, and that was like 20 minutes. Um, but let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, here is the little uh, little uh, attention getter and the topic. Let's start with the attention getter. If you're not ready to die for it, put the word freedom out of your vocabulary. 
Because I agree with Malcolm X that freedom requires a fight, and because this fight realistically requires violence, I affirm, resolved, violent revolution is a just response to political oppression. Okay, so a couple things. First on the little, like, quote at the beginning, right? That's that's a very common sort of traditional uh, way of starting a debate round, especially at um, a you know, uh, 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 on, a, on a stage like this. Um, it's not as common in more technical uh, tournaments and settings and rounds. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just one of those things where people have done it just because they see other people do it. And that's not really my... I don't really have much of a prescriptivist model of debate. I don't really subscribe to that school, right? So what do I mean by that? In my mind, like when I teach debate, I don't really tell my students how to debate beyond a couple weeks of introduction. But the idea is that you send people to their first tournaments and hopefully they win enough rounds so that they don't quit. But like literally no more rounds than that. Like if you're gonna go to the next tournament, no matter what, I hope you lose every single round. And then what you do is you try to figure out, okay, that is one scenario in which I lost for X reason. How do I prevent losing that way again? And I sort of mentor my students in figuring that out. How do we not lose that way again? And that's really useful for a couple reasons. One, it gets you a lot less scared of losing, which is a necessary part of uh, getting very good at any activity, but especially debate. Uh, it also makes it so that there's there's no... I, I'm not telling you how debate is supposed to be, right? If something you're doing isn't causing you to lose, then will never I'll never correct you on it. It'll, it'll never come up, right? And I think that creates better debaters. So with that having been said, like I wonder to what degree someone like has anyone ever lost a debate round because they didn't define terms or not the define terms is one example, right? Depends on the terms, right? But like give this quote, right? There's a lot of things that go into this traditional model that like <sighs> wastes a lot of time. And I wonder which of those things actually produce real results. Maybe it does, right? But maybe it doesn't. Okay, now let's talk about the topic. Um, the topic is violence is a just... Let's, let's go back to it. What, what is the topic? With Malcolm X, that freedom requires a fight. And because this fight realistically requires violence, I affirm, resolved... Violent revolution is a just response to political oppression. Violent revolution is a just response to oppression. Okay, so a few things that immediately jump out to me as an experienced debate coach is, first, what kind of resolution is this? There's different kinds of resolutions. So um, one example uh, is a policy resolution. I don't mean policy debate. I mean, it, it depends on the kind of question that the resolution is asking. This is not asking a policy question. A policy question is one in which there is an actor and an action. So that means the resolution is about someone doing something. The United States should increase the minimum wage, right? And there's a few important implications with that that really, really shape the debate in significant ways. Um, the first is argument structure in policy rounds. I would recommend like advantage structure. We have videos on that. If you want to know more about what that is, um, even if you're not calling your arguments advantages, you just call them contentions. I would use advantage structure. In other words, if you're not using advantage structure, your arguments will have glaring weaknesses that anyone that is aware of advantage structure will be able to take advantage of. The other important implication is that when we're, have, when we're talking about a policy, the debate becomes a question about the desirability of the status quo. And what that means is the debate becomes a comparison about, like, it's not just about, like, will this create more good or will this create more bad? Uh, will this work? Will it not work? It's that and also compared to a world in which we do nothing. 
will we be worse off in that world, right? This doesn't frame things around a policy action that is happening now. And so what the status quo looks like isn't inherently important to the debate. In other words, you could use arguments from, you could use historical arguments. You could use completely theoretical arguments, right? There, like, like here is this philosopher's political theory on oppression. And you don't necessarily have to have a way that that links into a particular scenario happening right now. So in other words, there's a lot of arguments where if we're talking about a policy, you could say, well, that clearly doesn't apply in this specific scenario because this debate isn't just about like whether the minimum wage should increase. It's about whether Ohio's minimum wage for tipped workers should increase, right? But when the resolution is this broad and not a policy, you really have a lot of ideas that can get included in there. The other thing about this resolution, in addition to it being kind of like a value facty thing, is that it's um, what, what we call a methods debate. So what is that? Let's say we have a resolution that is social media does more harm than good, right? Um, in that debate, there will be arguments from each side. So let's say the affirmative says social media is good because, or sorry, social media is bad because it um, spreads medical misinformation about things like vaccines. Um, and the negative says, no, 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 social media is good because it inspires and facilitates uh, like political revolution in places like the Middle East. Okay. So let's say both of these arguments are true. And that's actually something that happens in most debate rounds. Unless the debaters are really bad at researching, most of their arguments probably are true. Unless they're trying to do some sort of weird nuclear war shenanigans, right? Um, but in this debate, I, I expect most of the evidence... I mean, I don't expect anybody to, to be reading evidence and then for me to be like, that came from a blog and it's unreliable, right? I, they're, they're, they're national finalists. Like, they know what's reliable. So in the scenario that I described, a judge ultimately has to make their decision based on what kind of impact they value over another kind of impact. And that becomes really what the whole debate is about. So it becomes winnable by either side, but contingent on whether medical misinformation is just a categorically more significant thing than political revolution or vice versa, right? Um, and that becomes very significantly about questions of how the round is framed. Like weighing is one thing. Everybody thinks of weighing when I talk about impacts, but you're skipping a step, right? Like, like framework is the, is the ultimate question. Don't worry about this. If you're not experienced in the debate, you don't know what I mean, but if you're a little farther along, like weighing is a question of who better meets the framework. So the framework is the prior question, right? If an argument is framed out of the debate, then how you talk about its probability or scope or whatever isn't going to make a difference. Okay, so methods debate. Methods debates are different. Methods debates are debates in which both teams agree on what the most important impact is. Sometimes, a lot of the time, that's because that is explicitly stated in the resolution. Like, uh, Blank is the most effective way of achieving blank. Well, we know that that second blank is what all of our arguments are framed around. And if that's your impact, then that is good. So then the question is just like, what is the most effective way of achieving this? But a lot of the times the, the, the resolution doesn't inherently preclude people from being able to argue like this impact isn't important. Right. Like in this debate, the affirmative is going to say, like, well, it's really bad when people are oppressed. So it's justified that they use violence. I don't expect the negative is going to say it doesn't matter that people are oppressed. Like them being oppressed isn't important. 
And so a lot of methods debates just sort of come out of both teams being strategically motivated or just because of the strategy they used in the round. They agree on the outcome that they consider the most important. So the significance of that is now the debate becomes much, much more significantly about the evidence because you're not really doing impact weighing in the same way. Um, and, and y yeah, right. So that's the second thing. Third thing is there's a, there's a, there's, there is a framework question still, and, and that comes down to like, what is the burden of the affirmative? So the resolution says that violence is a just response to political oppression, something like that. Right. Well, what, what does that mean? Right. Like in other words, what if, what if at the end of the round, the judge believes that, um, there are 100 effective ways, in fact, 100 more effective ways of ending, uh, political oppression, but violence is like the 101st best way but it is a viable and just way, right? Like, does it have to be the most just, the most viable, or does the affirmative just have to prove that of all of the things that one can do, violence is one valid option? That kind of shifts the burden, the, the like, how difficult the debate is for the affirmative or the negative really significantly. And that's something that you do want to lay a lot of framework out for. We're going to, I got as far as the, um, affirmative speaker starting to mention this, but I, like, I, but I don't have to have seen him do that. This is just strategically something that you need to do. And so there's sort of like layers to this debate, right? Even though it's ostensibly a, a simple question and simple arguments, there is this layer of like, how just is violence? And then there's a the more foundational uh, question of how just does it need to be in order for the affirmative to have proven the resolution true. So there is the evidence, but always there is also the interpretation of the resolution and the framing of how the judges are thinking uh, about it and acting on it. So now that I've spent another 20 minutes and hopefully this video doesn't cut off, let's get into the actual stuff. Because all humans share an intrinsic worth that entitles them to certain dues from their government, my value is justice, defined as giving each their due. So, right, like, this is a perfect example. The value is justice. Why? Because that's what you're going to have to, the resolution doesn't give you a lot of options. That's what you're going to have to argue anyway. I'd be really surprised if the other side is like, no, justice isn't the thing that we're trying to accomplish here or isn't the most important thing. So then it really becomes about how do we measure justice? Um, which is the value criterion, right? The value criterion is the criteria by which the, the, the set of tools by which you measure whether we are getting this thing that is your value. What is your value? Your value is, there's a lot of ways of explaining what a value is. I think most of them are bad. I think the value that you propose is the core impact of the round, right? It is, it is the core thing that every other argument must interact with in order for the judge to consider it. Um, but with something as vague as justice, it almost doesn't matter. Okay. The value criterion is mitigating structural oppression for three reasons. First, excluding voices allows the ideologies of the privileged to be deemed as universal and true. One sec. Notice how he didn't justify the value, but he is justifying the value criterion. That is because there is a lot more chance that there's actually going to be clash on the value criterion, that the negative is going to try to use a different value criterion. But because the value of, you know, justice is a given in the resolution, he doesn't really need to waste his time there. But okay, let's go on. Only when everyone has a say in the government can the government be just. Second, 
Structural oppression creates skewed, unjust power disparities in both. I also don't like that framing. I mean, I don't think this debate is going to come down to like solvency or use, but you, you, you don't want to put yourself in that position where you're like, only when every single person has a voice can justice exist and then later say, and thus my, I have a high probability of creating justice with my advocacy. Like you're setting the bar really, really, really high and uh, you don't want that used against you. Both citizen-citizen relationships and citizen-government relationships. This grossly unbalanced power dynamic leaves innocent fates at the whims of oppressors, allowing oppressors to treat them as subhuman and remove their dignity. I also don't think they time an SDA finals. So if you're watching this and you're like, this is how I should speak NLD, like I'm by no means saying you should talk a mile a minute, but um, you probably want to be a lot more uh, conscious of your time then. And I don't think this is the way this debater speaks when it's an 8 a.m. prelim with just him and a judge in a room, right? Anyway. Third, because only my criterion can address, because only my criterion can address real world issues. Absolutist conceptions of justice fail to apply to real world condi conditions. Okay, so we have a video um, I made called like, something about how value criterions don't matter, right? Um, and that is true, um, with one exception. The, 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 the purpose of framework, of a value, a value criterion, right, is to exclude your opponent's arguments from the debate, right? In other words, your opponent has, it's a defensive move. You, you predict that your opponent will have an argument that you can't beat with if, it, if the judge is considering it because the scope of the impact is too big or whatever, right? Um, and so framework is where you make a case for which arguments should be included specifically so that those arguments are not included. If you have the best impacts in the round, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what, the, what the value criterion is, right? Like it doesn't matter if we're talking about justice or if we're talking about education or if we're talking about like fairness or I don't know, um, uh, uh, the greater good, utilitarianism, deontology, right? In Cross X, my question is uh, like, hey, is everyone dying in a fire bad under your value criterion? And the answer is probably yes, right? Like you dying in a fire makes it so that you can't uh, I don't know why it's a fire. Uh, <laughs> it makes it so that you can't have education. You can't have justice. You can't have fairness. You can't have a good quality of life, right? So if you have a really significant impact, then you don't need to play this game where you're excluding your opponent's arguments. So knowing that, ask yourself, what is this argument trying to accomplish? right? What argument is this trying to exclude? And the reason it's trying to exclude that argument is because this case struggles against that argument, which means if you identify what that argument is and you have a route into the debate where you think, you know what, I think I can get the judge to go for this, that's probably the way to go, right? In other words, when you notice it's like in boxing, where if you notice like your opponent is, I don't know what, you don't, you don't box. There's not a lot of children who box and do debate, but you know, in boxing, the sweet science, you can only protect so many parts of your body at the same time with like two hands. And so the idea is that while most people protect their face at all times, the lower someone's, um, arms go, um, the more likely it is that they're hurt in their in their ribs, right? The more the more they're protecting it, the more that suggests they have concern over that. And there's two ways to react in boxing and in debate, right? One way is your attention went low, so my attack is going to go high because you've created an opening there because your attention wasn't on it. Um, the other 
uh, strategy is your attention is on this because you're concerned about it. That indicates to me that it's a weakness, and I think I can get around your defensive and defenses anyway and attack that weakness, right? Um, same in debate or really any competitive activity. Um, so we will later see whether the negative is going to try to attack through this defense or navigate around it in some sort of um, clever way. Lane 2009 explains, the search for perfect justice is regressive because societies will never agree on a perfect set of rules and institutions. This search distracts us from tackling real life injustices. So that's the that's a strategy, right? He knows that the negative can try to use the argument that violence is never really just. Uh, an eye for an eye makes the world go blind or something like that, right? And so he's saying, well, this just distracts us from addressing real injustice. And we'll see how this argument holds up through the debate. But it is the major pillar of the affirmative strategy so far. The perfect becomes the enemy of the good. The competing vision of justice is a comparative one, which examines the kind of lives people actually can lead. For clarity, I offer one observation. The resolution does not force the affirmative to defend the use of violence in every instance of political oppression, or even in the majority of cases. The affirmative must only prove that violent revolution is a just tool in the toolbox. So this is what I, going back to what I was talking about with like, there's a hundred methods justice is, or violence is one of them, right? This is definitely what an affirmative wants, and it's definitely what a negative does not want the affirmative to have. So that's a layer in which they are going to debate, and that is why we have evidence there, right, in the, in the framework, because it's going to help with winning that, like, comparative framework debate later. But, um, there was something you said a second ago that I also had a thought on. It's a comparative one, which examines the kind of lives people actually can lead. For clarity, I offer one observation. The resolution does not force the affirmative. Oh, it was that um, it, it would behoove the negative here to, you know, a lot of the affirmative strategy is dependent on this framing, this idea that the negative's arguments are based on lofty, unrealistic ideals that only distract, right? And so I think a negative case on this topic should probably include a lot of, like, practical um, instances in which what they are advocating for has been proven to be true. And that is like where your evidence plays a really big role and where you probably don't want to rely too much on abstract, like ethical concepts rather than tactile, like here's what happened one time in this country. Okay to defend the use of violence in every instance of political oppression or even in the majority of cases. The affirmative must only prove that violent revolution is a just tool in the toolbox. Contention one, in the face of oppression, people retain the right to harm their oppressors. This right flows from our innate right to self-defense, as Locke explains. Whosoever uses force without right puts himself into a state of war with those against whom he uses it. In that state, all former ties are canceled, all other rights cease, and everyone has a right to defend himself to resist the aggressor. Contention two. All Whoa, that was a very quick, very short argument. And I mean, it's a very, there's many different like styles and schools of LD. And this is like, like my boss would like this a lot. Um, yeah, so this would be considered like traditional and that's where, you know, you like bring up philosophy and I, I, I almost really don't like the framing of like this style of debate as being a very philosophically driven style. I mean, honestly, I think like like critical debate and technical debate, even though they're not 
I, I just made a video talking about this, right? I feel like every time I criticize traditional debate, people think I like, you know, like critical debate. And every time I criticize critical debate, people think I like traditional debate, but that's not, that's I, neither are my ideal uh, style of debate. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think w the way these arguments are structured wouldn't really hold any water in an actual academic philosophical setting. Like you quoted two sentences by John Locke and that is the argument. Like what is the justification for that? What is the, what are the premises on which those are built and what is your warrants and evidence for why those premises are true? Um, so I don't really like this argument, right? This, this argument is only as good as John Locke is someone people will blindly trust. And there's no reason why people should do that, especially with John Locke. Okay. Alternatives to violence are ineffective at mitigating structural oppression. This is for four reasons. First, Nonviolence isn't effective anymore because regimes are becoming increasingly savvy at dealing with the techniques of nonviolent protests. Erica Chenoweth finds in a 2017 study that from 2010 through May 2016, the success rates of nonviolent campaigns have significantly declined. New authoritarian techniques designed to undermine and thwart nonviolent activists are to blame. One of these adaptations is counter protests. Hellmeyer 19, a study of movements under oppressive regimes, found that governments often create fake pro-government rallies during episodes of large domestic and regional opposition. These concurrent rallies deter participation in the anti-government movements because those anti-government movements are falsely seen as not credible and irrepresentative. Second, the rise of the internet is leading to detrimental failures in nonviolent revolutions. According to Name of the Atlantic in 2014, quote, before the internet, the tedious work of organizing that was required to form a protest also helped build infrastructure for decision-making and strategies. Now, movements can rush past that step to their own detriment. Third, nonviolence is counterproductive since it only forces the government to make cosmetic changes. Gelderloos explains in 2013, quote, if we look at all the major rebellions of the last two decades, Nonviolence can only affect cosmetic change of the government because nonviolent resistance has never been able to resist the full force of the state. Take, for instance, Sudan, which proves that a nonviolent protest can't create necessary change. In Sudan, the people have nonviolently demanded substantive democratic reforms from the government. However, the government has only made cosmetic changes with the underlying oppressive, corrupt institutions remaining. Fourth, when nonviolence has worked, it was only because of the threat of violence. The fear of violence is what has brought governments to the negotiating table with moderate nonviolent movements. Lay on 15, in an empirical study- Whoa, you Okay, hold on, let's go, let's, let's go back. Um, okay, again, very talented person, great job, kudos. Um, I don't like these arguments. Uh, and the reason why I don't like them is because I don't think they, they, they're, they're too much in a vacuum, and I don't think they represented a clear vision of seeing the forest for the trees, right? So in other words, I don't think, I think every contention could, t could, should contain within it the justification for should contain within it the, the, the story you're telling in this debate. And the story you should be telling in this debate is that violence is justified, right? This argument only contains reasons why nonviolent, it's a defensive contention, right? I don't think any of your contentions should be defensive ever. Um, what is the difference between a defensive contention and, or a defensive argument and an offensive argument? Defense and offense are um, – if, if the winner of a debate is determined on which impact the judge votes for, offense is generating impact. Sorry that I hit this. It's generating impact. So offensive arguments are saying something happens, right? 
Uh, the affirmatives, offensive arguments are good things that happen as a result of doing the plan. The negatives offense is bad things that happen as a result of the advocacy, right? In this case, like violent responses to oppression. Defensive arguments are about preventing impacts. So their defensive arguments say something doesn't happen. And so this is a defensive argument against nonviolent movements, um, which says defense or uh, nonviolent movements don't create successful whatever, right? So a few strategic reasons why I think this is bad. One, why are we starting this case off with defense, right? Why, why, why are we having defense? You have other speeches to read defense, right? You're like predicting the kinds of nonviolence that your opponent is going to advocate for. Maybe you're just trying to make a point, but it's, it's not like these examples are going to hold up if your opponent has different kinds of examples. So you may as well just wait to see what your opponent says and then use these arguments if they're relevant. But the other issue with these uh, defensive arguments is that it immediately invites the question, right? What is the most important question about this argument? I watch some chess videos sometimes and the chess people say, pause the video here and see if you can figure out. Uh, so, so if your advocacy is for why violence is acceptable and the affirmatives and your let's say you're the negative, right? If the topic is that the is that violence is acceptable, your opponent is saying, here are some situations in which nonviolence did not solve the problem. What is the question that you need to ask or the thing that you need an answer to? The thing that you need an answer to is the propensity for violence to have solved those exact situations right? They're not my examples. They're the affirmative examples. So can you name who in the Sudanese government protesters should have killed in order for this protest movement to have been successful? Can, like, like, if you're talking about like nonviolent campus protests or whatever, like what, who should they have killed, right? Who should they have attacked? Sure. Like, so like, it, 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 that, that's what I mean, right? It, 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 it's one thing to say that nonviolence didn't solve these situations, but your advocacy requires you to prove that violence has a higher propensity to solve those situations. Otherwise, all you're proving is that there were five situations that were very difficult to solve. Um, not that one method is a better method, to, right? We were talking about a methods debate. It's comparing methods to achieving a goal to say that one method was bad without talking about why your method would have been better i think is a very weak argument um but let's go on eating table with moderate nonviolent movements oh and this argument right the threat of violence i would argue is not violence right um in other words i would say that like The, the, the debate is not about whether using the concept of violence in, in the face of oppression is, is just or not just, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't think the affirmative should be able to say, oh, here's a nonviolent thing that is successful, but it's only successful because the concept of violence exists. Um, I think that's a little bit outside the scope of the resolution, or at least I think I would have some luck arguing that as the negative. We'll see what the negative does. Lay on 15, in an empirical study utilizing data from 100 years, concluded that the threat of violence has been the common denominator among successful revolutions. Contention three. Hold on. So in other words, this isn't like the negative isn't advocating for a world in which violence never happens or magically doesn't exist. It's just saying uh, no one is ever justified in using violence. I think the affirmative's argument implies that if violence wasn't possible and if oppressors knew that protesters 
could or would never use violence, then nonviolent protests would be ineffective. But I don't think that scenario is one that realistically would arise, right? Um, okay. Violence is effective at mitigating structural oppression. Okay, so see, like, this feels like on its face, this seems like, oh, okay, you gave me the reasons why uh, A doesn't work and B, uh, B does work. So it seems like he's addressing the point that I was making earlier, but I'm assuming that the scenarios we're about to hear are completely different scenarios and we're not getting any closer to knowing what the propensity of violence to solving the previous scenarios are. This is for three reasons. First, violence is the only possible response to severe oppression. In cases where the oppressor is unwilling to listen to the demands of the oppressed, violence becomes a necessary tool in the toolbox, as nonviolence is dependent upon the oppressor's willingness to recognize the rights of the oppressed. Simply put, nonviolence requires the unwilling oppressor to grant the oppressed rights, whereas violence enables the oppressor to secure rights for themselves. I think one weakness of not weakness, but I think one, whatever, I'll say weakness. We don't know what violence means in the context of this debate. Right? We don't know whether, like, like, is a police strike violence, right? Is, is, um refusing to produce food for someone violence right or like it, 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 it's 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 like like think about it in international relations like are sanctions hard power or soft power like is that violence to have sanctions against a country a lot of people would argue yes right and i think that matters because these now become it's a question of who has access to these arguments like here is an effective tool like um general strikes um is that violence or is that non-violence like which team gets to use that as a tally on their like whose method is that um so i think what the affirmative is trying to do here is they are trying to um take a lot of things for their side that are not inherently like someone got killed. Um, and one other thing that I'll put here is that in, in, de in debate, everyone's always, in, in argumentation, everyone's always basing their positions on a lot of premises. And there's something that we call an implicit premise. Um, which means that it it's just implied. They don't they don't they might not even realize that they're thinking it, right? But the implicit well, they're saying violence is the only possible reaction to this, right? Um, the implicit premise here is that for whatever reason it's not valid to just be oppressed and do nothing about it, which is a valid ethical model, right? Like that is an ethical model that Many of, I, I mean, that's like a lot of pacifism and Buddhism is based around that. Uh, a lot of Christianity is based around that. Obviously, all of these religions are complex and there's different schools of thought and different interpretation. But like, what is turning the other cheek, right? Somebody like slaps you in the face instead of doing something to prevent it from happening again or retaliating you just turn the other cheek so they can slap that one right and your ultimate like reward is that i don't know you go to heaven or something i, I didn't read the book um <laughs> but um but yeah so so that is something like i said earlier that is an assumption that a negative could attack right but what, who is your audience? What is the propensity for them to um, be persuaded by that? So I doubt that the negative is going to. So this is a, a this is a sort of not fully. This is a bit of an assumption, 
that um, a, a leap that the affirmative is making here, but in this case, I don't think it's going to negatively affect them. Um, because I don't think that the negative wants to put their eggs in that basket. Okay, let's keep going. Second, violence unifies the un oppressed, allowing them to overcome historic rivalries. Sue Ann Foster explains in 2005, quote, this, this, this point it goes back to what, what he was saying in the, in the last contention too, saying like, ah, nonviolent movements are really difficult to organize. <laughs> Like, like, what's, what's the alternative? Like, like terrorist organizations? Like, like an organization highly organized with power structures within them, uh, specifically for the purpose of committing violence, right? Like, and, and I guess this is what I'm looking to hear here. Like, how do, uh, how does the goal of creating violence overcome the organizational barriers that you described in the previous contention? Revolutionary violence, quote, unifies the people by blurring ethnic differences. The armed struggle brings tribal warfare, a legacy of colonialism, to a halt by throwing people in one way and one direction. Third, I feel like there's a lot of genocides that would disprove. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Guerrilla warfare is a powerful tool in overthrowing governments. Guerrilla warfare has allowed violent rebel groups to overcome the government's power advantage and strike strategically at the heart of regimes' interests. Joseph Kramer of the Northeastern Political Science Association writes in 1971, quote, Counter-guerrilla warfare is extremely expensive, while guerrilla warfare is extremely inexpensive. The ratio of government soldiers required to handle a given number of guerrilla fighters demonstrates the elusiveness of the guerrilla. For these reasons, I continue to affirm. What am I doing? Okay. Okay. Um, I think that this affirmative didn't go as hard in the paint as I would have liked. And maybe that's because not a lot of other people are like looking for arguments like, here's who we should kill and why. <laughs> um, but, I, but I mean, I think the advocacy of the affirmative kind of requires that, right? And if, and if I'm the negative, I am holding the affirmative to that. Like, can you tell me someone who's alive today that we should kill? Uh, and if they can't, I think that really discredits their, their premise, right? Because the, the, what they are saying is that violence is a necessary tool. Um, and if it's necessary, like, t t tell me who you want to kill. Um, anyway, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I would have liked a lot more specific examples um, of successful violent movements. Um, and why violence was a key aspect of their success, right? Like when we talked about methods debate, it came down to just this idea that like, if you want to know what the best method is, like testing is a huge part of that. And we're not really hearing a lot of evidence for how violence has been tested and shown to work well. Uh, other than like guerrilla warfare is generally effective, but it doesn't. But that, you're not telling me what oppressed people used guerrilla warfare to become unoppressed and needed to have been violent in order to succeed at that. I think that is 
the logical that that is the logical necessity of that position. Uh, but let's see how the cross examination goes. I think I won't talk too much about what I would ask because I feel like it, it, you know I've been kind of asking questions and bringing up points um, as I've been going. The the one thing I will say is that a huge part of cross examination strategy is getting your opponent to say something that you can then use to support your later arguments. So for example, I mean, the basic idea is that your opponent's going to want to disagree with the premises of your arguments, right? But if they have already said something that agrees with one of the premises of your argument, they're probably not going to want to contradict themselves. And that's going to make it a lot harder for them to take out that argument. So the, like if I was doing cross-examination based on the points I've been raising up, I wouldn't just be like, well, isn't that uneffective? Or can you give me an example? I think these are very bad cross-examination questions. And I have a whole hour long video on uh, cross-examination that um, covers strategy and, you know, guiding principles on how to do it well. Everybody? Uh, okay. Are any means of violence just as a response to political oppression? Right. Are any means of violence just? Um, I don't... So when you're asking like a yes or no question, some people have this idea that you shouldn't ask yes or no questions. I don't know if that's entirely true. But... I mean, it feels like there's a... Vi whenever you're answering questions, you're trying to figure out what is the safest answer I can give. And the safest answer is always reiterating something you already said. Because if the thing you said before can hurt you, you saying it twice isn't going to hurt you more. But you saying something new could hurt you in brand new ways, right? So I think the affirmative here is just going to say, yeah, no, I said in the beginning that I don't have to show that violence is always acceptable, but that like some forms of violence are sometimes acceptable. So I think violence is a just option for a few reasons. First of all, because the oppressed are guaranteed this innate right to self-defense, which allows right. them to push back against their oppressors. I'm asking you more specifically, what type of violence is allowed? Right, so I think there are lots of types of violence that are allowed, but I think the most effective means would probably be guerrilla warfare, because guerrilla warfare allows you to overcome the power disparity between a really oppressive government and a pretty weak people. He probably understands the question, but he's taking advantage of the ineffective framing of the question. Um, so your goals in cross-examination are to rely on things you've already said, but also like reiterate those. Like the other benefit of reiterating what you've already said is not only do you not generate any new links for the other side, but you're reminding your audience. You're like getting this into the forefront of their mind. What she means to ask is, is there any kind of violence that you aren't defending, that like you don't feel are justified? And um, that's not really how she's framing it, but that's what she means. Okay, guerrilla groups often use things like sexual coercion and rape, no. innocent so children or civilians being killed. Do you advocate for those types of violence too? No, there is a very big distinction between terrorism and guerrilla warfare. But is terrorism violence, right? So the question is, what, what can the affirmative sever out of? In other words, what does, when, and this is why the definition of violence is so important and the framing is really important, right? Because of course, the affirmative wants to say, oh, these kinds of violence are the kinds that we want to say are good. And the negative wants to say these kinds of violence are the kind that we want to say are bad. And they're rarely talking about the same instances of violence. So then the question is, are both arguments valid in the debate or are only one set of arguments speaking to the question that the resolution is asking? And that is why in um, somewhat less traditional 
uh, debate, we have plans, right? That's where the affirmative, and uh, you can only have a plan for a policy resolution. This is not one of them, right? But uh, it, 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 for a policy resolution, the affirmative says, this is how we think this idea should be implemented. This is our specific advocacy, right? And that way you don't end up in these situations where the affirmative is defending one kind of action and the negative is attacking a different kind of action uh, and, and and they're just not interacting with each other at all. And we end up with this scenario where violence could be good, violence could be bad, but terrorism isn't guerrilla warfare. Like, that's not... That leads to, let's say, split panels, right? There's, there's multiple ju people judging this round and a lot of final rounds, right? But I would think of this in terms of even just prelims. Even if we have one judge, there is a large pool of people who could have been your judge for that round. And the question is, is the way you are utilizing your strategy dependent on just the like luck or just how that judge happens to parse through these arguments? A lot of very traditional debate tends to just rely on like judges just kind of willy-nilly making their own decisions right whereas more technical like on the flow debates have very little of that where it's like look at the piece of paper and if the thing that is there says this thing then i win right and um one of the downsides of a very sort of like hands-off not as detail-oriented debate is Judges will make their own decisions in ways that you don't really have any say over, or at least these debaters don't currently have any say over it because the framework is what tells the judge how they must evaluate the round, and they debate that back and forth. And at the end of the day, like the judge should use that as the way they evaluate the round. They don't always – like it's not like they're going to go to prison. Like they don't have to, but – it's something good to advocate for here, right? But uh, but here they haven't really done that, and I wonder if the negative is going to do a better job. And so I think that is where you end up with rounds where, like, like let's say Paul in, like, his final round or whatever ever at his, like, semifinals of MPTE or something. Um, it's not like he left that round thinking – man, I wish the judges would have felt this. He's leaving the round thinking, man, I wish we had focused on this argument and made this point or whatever, right? Like it's this, I, the, it's this idea that it's under your control and that you have power over how a judge makes a decision. Um, when you don't have that framing, I, like I don't know what's going to happen here. Either side could win this. And I, to me, that doesn't make the game of debate more interesting. I think it makes it more arbitrary. Terrorism is when the groups specifically target innocent civilians. Guerrilla warfare is what happened in the American Revolution, when you specifically target government troops. Okay, can you tell me an example of a violent revolution recently that has only targeted the government and not harmed innocent civilians? Violent revolutions? I think there are lots of examples. I think we can look at freedom fighters in Syria, for instance, in specific cases, not ISIS. I'm, of course, not talking about ISIS. How are they not freedom fighters in Syria? Like, you're, of course, not talking about them because they don't help your point. But the question is... Can you talk about a resistance movement that has not targeted innocent people? The fact of the matter is that if terrorist movements weren't an effective means of fighting oppression, like, they wouldn't exist, right? Like, that's their whole point. I think the negative is correct in, like, I, I, I think ostensibly that doesn't help the negative. Like, oh, okay, you just named another way that violence is successful in ending oppression. But uh, obviously the affirmative doesn't want to be seen as defending that, right? Like now if the framing of the round was just ending oppression, like ending a set of unjust laws, and that is the only framework that we're looking at, 
then in theory, innocent people dying is outside the scope of like that impact, right? And so that doesn't really get weighed under that. The affirmative isn't really committing to that and that a little bit undermines the framework that we're given because it's clear that there are like when he says, well, I'm obviously not defending this, like it's clear that there's some other value at play here guiding what the affirmative is willing to advocate for and is not willing to advocate for. And that makes it more difficult for him to frame this question of this is just about a method of overthrowing oppression as being like the core thing. So I think this is ultimately a, a, the right strategy for the negative to, to show that the affirmative isn't willing to defend the violence. And I think, I think my point earlier of like, I think right now we're, we're letting the affirmative sanitize violence way too much by like romanticizing like the people committing the violence, right? But, but I think a way around that is ask about who the violence would be committed against and how, right? Find a way of sanitizing, like saying like, oh, you should murder so-and-so. Like that's a lot harder. But I'm talking about like the free Syrian army where they're able to actually effectively counter Assad and protect innocent people. All right, but in that case, didn't these actions lead to a major state of chaos with almost hundreds of thousands of citizens dying in that country? Bad question. I think the question, like, like you, you've made your point very clear, right? I think I should, you shouldn't have even asked that. They gave the example of Syria. Your next speech, you come up and say, they bring up Syria as their only example of like violence that they defend, and look what happened in Syria. All you're doing now is giving him the opportunity to respond to that argument, right? Don't do that, right? Don't make arguments in cross -ex. You're only looking for thing you're only looking for ammo and that's not what the negative is doing here the negative is like well don't you disagree with your own point aren't i right and the, the affirmative is never going to say like oh man you're right like i i give up right so if you have a good point cross this is not where you make it you write that down you use it in your speech I think that's the fault of the government. I think the actual rebels are being very effective at actually countering Assad and at actually protecting innocent civilians. How does that make... What? The point of effectiveness is measured in their ability to overthrow the government. And the question is, well, aren't they not overthrowing the government? And he's like, well, that's the government's fault, right? I'm being... This is really hard, right? Like, like it's one thing to literally sit in my armchair and eat my quadratini raspberry wafer crackers uh, and be like, that's not what I would have said. It's, it's a lot harder when you're under that amount of pressure and on that kind of stage to speak, let alone think critically about these things. But, but whatever, that I'm, I'm supposed to give analysis on what I think is good and what is bad, and I didn't think that was good. And I think we can look to more historic examples, too, going back to the example of the American Revolution, where the United States military, which was one of the weakest on the planet, was able to overcome the British military, which had the strongest naval force, which had the strongest land force, in a decisive victory. And that really attests to the power of guerrilla warfare. Okay. It's able to overcome these oppressive regimes. You specifically cite that we're able to overcome oppression. Do right. you have an example of a government that's formed recently from violent revolution that doesn't perpetuate more oppression? Right, so I think there are a couple problems with your analysis. It's not an analysis, it's a question, and I think she is letting him get way too much leeway with how he answers these questions, how long he takes to answer that. I mean, I know why he's doing that, and I'm not saying, like, he is being rude or he is being a bad person for doing this. It's a competitive activity, and his goal in this cross X is to get the hell away from these questions, right? There's no question that is going to 
help him in the debate. He's just trying to get out of there alive. And so by him taking his time answering these questions, uh, that means fewer questions get to be asked. And that's why how you frame your questions is really important and sort of not allowing the question to be dodged is also very important. It's also all very difficult to do, especially if you're like a female presenting debater having to, you know, combat the imbalanced perceptions of whether you're being like rude by, I don't know, trying to hold your ground or something in a situation like that, right? I'm not saying it's simple. I'm just saying that's what's happening here. First of all, we can never definitively say that one variable. You can you can, you could see it in our eyes, right? Like, like that. That's not the that's not the look of somebody who feels in control of what's happening right now. I think she's just sort of thinking about like, I really want to interrupt, but I don't know how to do that in a you know sanitized way will cause a more oppressive government or a less oppressive government. In fact, Perworski 12, She's like a study down conducted out of time. from Duke University, concluded like, oh, that in God. the body of she's, available she's quoting uh, evidence now. political uh, science, in the body of available statistics, it's impossible to come to a definitive statistical conclusion that one variable will lead to okay. a better government. But, but that's, that's not my question. I'm asking... If it's impossible... Like, see, the, the affirmative is, is doing a lot of this framing like... And this happens in debate sometimes where they're saying the, the question is like, does your method solve? And the affirmative's like, well, according to this piece of evidence, it's impossible to say that one method of doing something will lead to a better way of uh, having like a better system of government. It's like, Okay, so you don't prove the resolu the resolution true, right? Like, like what? So you're saying it's impossible for you to win. Like the resolution says, like your framing of the resolution is that this method creates a better government, right? And if you're now saying it's impossible to prove that a method produces a particular kind of government, then it sounds like you're saying it's impossible for you to meet the burden of the framework you've created, right? Um, to be careful about how you're trying to dodge these questions because debate is all about balance, right? Um, it's like judo where you can be knocked down because you're leaning too far back or you're leaning too far forward. And if, if any time your opponent is like really strongly resisting in one direction, there is probably a way to push them off balance in the other direction, right? So keep an eye out for stuff like that. You for an example of a violent revolution that didn't perpetuate oppression. Right, I can give you better than examples. I can provide you with an empirical study of past historical examples, which okay. says that nonviolence does contribute to non- Do you have any of those government. examples available? I mean, I can provide you with the empirical study. Okay, that's fine. What is if what? No, 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 no. That's not fine, right? Don't let that go, right? Uh, like he's saying, I can give you better than examples. Like, what's better than examples? <laughs> and his 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 like uh, his his better than examples is like, oh, there's a study, and it's like, okay, what places did that study look at? Right. And it's like, oh, I can maybe look at that. rather. So you can't do that. Right. And and the biggest the reason why I don't want to move on from here is that the biggest factor in how cross-examination influences a judge's decision is in the perception of who's winning the debate. In other words, cross-ex is the only time in the debate where the debaters are standing up side by side talking to each other. And there's all sorts of ways that judges look at the debaters to determine who seems like they're winning, who seems like they think they're winning here. And that has 
massive influence in their decision. And no, that's not just lay judges. That's every kind of judge. If you think a judge at the TOC out round is like not influenced by which side seems like they're winning, you're nuts, right? Like they are way more terrified because they are terrified of like that person's coach coming up after the round and chewing them out and asking them to explain their decision and why did this happen? And I've been on a lot of these panels and I can, pr I promise you these judges are very nervous. And when a judge is nervous, they make the safest available decision. And that decision is usually the person who seems like they're supposed to win is the one that won because that is the scenario in which I don't have to answer hard questions. That doesn't happen to me because I don't care if a, if a debater or their coach disagrees with my decision or thinks I'm dumb. I am very honest and direct about how I make my decisions beforehand. And then I'm very honest and direct about how I made my decision in a particular round. And if I haven't contradicted how I said I would evaluate the round, I don't care if you don't like the way I assess the round. Like, I, I'm the judge. Literally the point of the... Anyway, huge tangent. But I, I think somebody who's watching this cross-examination gets the perception that the affirmative speaker is in control. And that is not what you want. And sure, you might have other questions that you might want to ask, but one, I doubt it's going to get you much ammo because you haven't succeeded in much of that so far. Uh, and two, you're, you're kind of letting that perception be... Like... He's dodging a question, and now you're making it look like you're dodging the, the question, right? Like you're kind of making it look like his answer was sufficient. I don't mean you, the person in the video. I mean you, the you watching this, putting yourself in that role, right? This person is a much better debater than you, and maybe me. I don't know. So I'm, this is not a criticism of them. Solutions lead to government that don't actually reflect the oppressed. Is that a successful one? I think insofar as it's gotten rid of the existing structural oppression, yes. We should worry about overthrowing the government first, then worry about creating a new government. Okay, thank you. Okay, I imagine this person's going to give a brief thank you speech. Oh, they're taking prep. Why? Why? Whatever. Okay, I'm not gonna. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Oh, they can't bring their laptops up there? Is that true? Is she gonna be reading off hand notes? What is happening here? <laughs> okay. In theory, you should have known that these arguments would have been made by the final round of the national championships and you should have strategies and arguments pre-written and ready to just drag and drop and and go so i don't know exactly what's happening here but i don't know that's just the theory okay before i begin i'd like to thank a couple of people who have made this activity possible for me Hey, I'm so sorry I'm skipping your thank yous. Olivia, Mr. Such a rich compassion for balance and life about my success to be. So next we'll begin on the negative constructive. Round of applause. Uh, hey, it truly takes a village, folks. Um, next time you uh, think about, like, how debaters got good at debate, listen to these thank you speeches and realize how many other competitors, how many coaches, how much they think their parents, and ask yourself, like, how many people are you reaching out to to try to get better? How many people are you collaborating with? Um, because it does take, uh, it takes a village to, to raise a little debate child. Okay, let's go. Everyone good? Okay. 
<laughs> it's an audience. We don't like value 500. a right if it erodes the rights of all others. I negate the resolution resolved. Violent revolution is a just response to political oppression. I value justice, defined by Cambridge See, as the justice. condition of so being morally correct or fair. Clearly just a methods debate, right? And now, like, we're going to read a definition that does nothing. I mean, let's find out, right? But my assumption is this we agree on the value, right? So this definition will only help if it frames justice in A, a way that is different than how the affirmative framed it, and B, a different way that is conducive to winning the round. Other than Otherwise, you are just throwing time down the toilet, right? Let's Fair. see. My value criterion is maximizing human rights. Respecting human rights is key to achieving justice. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights argues that recognition of the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all is the foundation of justice. These rights include safety, preservation of self and life. Observation one, 16th and 17th century philosophy is ill-equipped to prescribe justice of violent revolution because it isn't shaped by risks, means of violence or outcomes that a modern day revolution requires. Buchanan in 17 argues a theory of just revolutionary war must be shaped by empirical considerations. Yet many philosophers who have had something to say about just revolutionary war have not understood the importance of empirical assumptions about the risks. The implication on today's debate is that revolutions that arise from the colonial era or predate modern weaponry with the capability to eliminate entire oppressed populations fail to account for the unique circumstances of modern warfare. Griffin in 16 describes, no longer can rebels meet their masters on equal footing. Governments now possess weapons of such destructive force, which are so technically above the skills of common citizens that revolutions can no longer be successful based on a test of military power. A surveillance state with guns, tanks, drones, and chemical weapons is capable of suppressing dissidents without even threatening their own security. Contention one. Mm, okay, so one, that is the right argument to make in response to Locke, right? And it addresses a lot of the weaknesses that I mentioned about that. I wish that it was a lot more specifically framed, right? Like, this contention is being raised as like a general argument against general kinds of philosophy, right? Like, why? There's no other 17th century philosopher being mentioned. Just, just make it much more specific. Specificity is always good. And so tell, like, like, think about the flow. Not that, you know, most of these people are flowing in this massive audience, but like, but, but, like, be specific. This is the point. Their contention is about John Locke. Here are all of the specific ways in which he is not who we should be looking to for this. Um, so I, I, thought, I thought that was good. I think there's, like, a further extension to that, which is this idea that, and I don't know how much of it, this is going to come up, but um, that basically John Locke is talking about self-defense, but in the context of like a rebellion or like a revolutionary war or whatever, um, that defense hurts people other than yourself, right? So it, it, it's kind of like you're being attacked and you like pick up a little kid and like use that, use that person to defend yourself, right? Because that's essentially what you're doing if you're in a power dynamic where your rebellion instigates reactionary violence on innocent people. Um, that is the point being made. I thought these points could have been a lot less abstract and a lot more direct, right? Framed more specifically rather than, I don't know, just this like theoretical concept, but I guess it sounds more like philosophical. So I don't know. Violent revolution allows illegitimate leaders to consolidate power. Revolution removes government and political organizations, creating chaos. Fairbanks in 07 describes a post-revolutionary state to be a political world without form and void. Revolutions are a fragile basis for government. After extremist politics emerge, wit revolutionaries withdraw from the political scene. Leaders become desperate because they know they don't have any support. In the end, rulers discover their self-interest. Coercion culminates into the emergence of a dictator. Revolutionary chaos doesn't form 
transformed into legitimate or rights-respecting government, it creates violent, consolidated rule. What's more, the use of violence in a revolution discourages democratic freedom. Finlay in 09 explains violent means could only give rise to violent ends. If revolution aims at the establishment of a sphere of democratic freedom liberated from the coercive structures of oppression, it must make a decisive break with coercion from the beginning. Violent revolution creates leaders who use violence to maintain their power. Kim in 2016 proves. Rev I think this uh, analysis is pretty decent, you know, pretty decent, pretty decent. Um, I think there's, a, it's a lot of information very quickly using kind of like sophisticated language and at a, at a, at a faster pace than the other debater was going. Um, I don't have any problem with it, but I wonder to what degree it's going to affect the outcome of the round. Um, the other thing here is that we're still not doing like, th okay, two things. We're still not really like saying like, we're arguing like A leads to B, right? So I'm sure I've talked about this every time I talk about debate, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, logical fallacy called denying the antecedent so um the example for this is is if dexter the serial killer not the boy child but i mean maybe even the one with the laboratory sure if if dexter forgets to clean his fingerprints from the crime scene he will get caught he did not forget to clean his fingerprints therefore he will not get caught at first, that argument feels sound, but there's a million other ways that Dexter can get caught, right? Um, so it, 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 it's if A, then B, not A, therefore not B. But that only works in a logical scenario where it's uh, only if A, then B, right? And so what, you, what your argument needs is, okay, like, Violent protests create these outcomes, and nonviolent protests don't. Um, I'm not, and, and in order to know that, I just want to hear one person be like, here is a scenario that was nonviolent and what would have happened if it was violent, or here's a scenario that was violent and what would have happened if it was nonviolent. But we're talking about completely different scenarios. And that is what makes traditional debate be determined by things like presentation and cross-examination. Like novice debate is so determined by those things, but it's because you're not good enough at debate yet to make a judge be able to make an objective decision on anything else. Like you've left so much of it in this nebulous state where they kind of have to pick an argument that like you want them to like your stuff and ignore the opponent's stuff because the arguments just don't interact with each other in such a way that you can consider everything equally and objectively conclude one thing. So, that's uh, this is a traditional debate. It has positives. The positive is I'm sure anybody watching this debate for the first time can follow it along. Uh, the downside is that um, the outcome is probably going to be a little more arbitrary than it is when debate is at its best. And I and I and I think there is this false dichotomy between like presentational and uh intelligible and understandable debate and like and like as though the only alternative to that is like fast and theory and case and stuff like that like that's not how i debated that's not how i teach my kids to debate and they do really well right and i think it's because once you have somebody who can do both like be presentational, be persuasive, be understandable, but also at the same time care about and understand the like underlying theory behind argumentation and how all of these things are interacting. Then you get what uh, Rocky's trainer Mickey called a very dangerous poison, uh, which is uh, Philadelphia for a very dangerous person. Okay. 
revolutionary leaders built in the course of revolutionary struggles perpetuate mass killing. This study uses data to demonstrate that revolutionary leaders are more likely to initiate genocide or politicide. Revolutionary leaders are more likely to commit mass violence. This effect is historically backed. Kattison in 97 argues that in Iran, their numerous revolts and revolutions were led against an unjust, arbitrary ruler to replace it with a just one. The result was generalized chaos until a new arbitrary rule was established. Following Libya's revolution, competing rival governments were no longer interested in representing the rights of the people, but rather in competing for power. Contention two. Okay, we're close, right? You just, now the question that I wanna hear is, okay, the year is 1979, and I am an Iranian that wants to not have the Shah in power, and I'm not gonna use violence. How do I do it, right? Um, but I, I like, again, I, I like that there's specific examples. Avoiding violent revolution maximizes human rights. Because violent revolution fails and causes the absolute destruction of human rights, there are two just choices the oppressed can use. First, they can use nonviolent revolution or protest. Carnes in 18 finds that nonviolent uprisings are almost three times less likely than violent ones to encounter mass killings. This is because violent revolutions threaten leaders and security forces alike, encouraging them to hold on to power at all costs, even ordering or carrying out a mass atrocity to survive. So I, this is, I think, a very important part of the negative strategy, which is framing the debate as, okay, uh, it, it's a two-part strategy, right? The first part is a solvency argument where it, it's just saying violent revolution has a low propensity to succeed. And then says, okay, so in a world in which violent revolution does not solve does not create a new non-oppressive government, right? Which I think she's read enough evidence to have access to that argument, and I think it wasn't particularly well responded to in cross X. We'll see what happens in the in the second affirmative speech. Um, the framing is, okay, so in a world where the two options are be oppressed, but there's no mass killings, uh, or, uh, or like, 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 just don't, don't fight your oppression. Let's say, don't fight your oppression, but there's no mass killings. Um, or, uh, fight your oppression and there are mass killings. But in both scenarios, you never end the oppression. That's kind of the core strategy of this negative. And that's why the affirmative has that, like, freedom is about dying you have to die for freedom I, I don't seems like if i had to define freedom in one way it would be not having to die for anything <laughs> like, like you just die whatever way just happens to you bro like <laughs> you don't have to die like that's what i would <laughs> define freedom as but um you can tell like this is what a lot of these debates have come down to I think given that you know this is what eventually the debate is going to be framed around, I think the front half of the debate could have been a little bit more focused and clean leading up to it. Second, they can escape their oppression. The right to exit functions as a check on political oppression. Koinova in 2009 explains diasporas unseat authoritarian regimes, and Leonard in 15 finds that when states behave oppressively towards their citizens, the right to exit offers a safety valve by providing citizens with an avenue to escape that oppression. With this in mind, we look to my opponent's case. On his value of justice... I think this... The negative is just going to have to give a really clear overview where they just say, like, later. Where they just say, look... Viol my opponent has not been able to show you any instance in which violence accomplishes anything with oppression other than just having a different person oppress you, right? I think that just needs to come out slow, loud, clear in her own words. I think the, the arguments are there, the material is on the flow, but I don't know whether it's been conveyed clearly. Okay. Let's 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 go on to the apps case. 
justice and value criterion of minimizing structural oppression, he has set a burden for himself that he must fulfill, that he can show to you that violent revolution will decrease structural oppression in any way, shape, or form. In the cross-examination, I asked him for an example of where this has ever happened in the last 50 years under modern warfare, and he could not provide me an example. He has the burden to prove to you that he actually solves for his value criterion, or we never achieve justice. There's two reasons that this is flawed. First, violent revolutions do not create oppressive leaders or regimes. That's what my Kim study articulates to you. It leads to revolutionary leaders who have used violence to get power and then use violence to maintain that power again, never giving the oppressed any political leverage. She is so much better when she's not reading off a script, right? Like when she is not sounding the way that she thinks she's supposed to sound for this audience and instead is giving analysis on her own, on her own words. Like th this is pretty much word for word what I was saying earlier and like listen to the way she sounds and and like the clarity and and like the the conciseness is really good um she sounds a little nervous but that's completely understandable given the circumstances and second of all, he has to tell you at what cost we value this right. How much violence, how many innocents dead, how much coercion are we allowed to use before we finally achieve our end goal? On his first contention, he said... I think that could have been elaborated on a little bit more and related to this terrorist argument that the terrorist argument is supposed to set this up, but you didn't really do the question that well. And now that you're getting to the point that you wanted to make, you're not really doing that that well. Like... You're not really going for it, right? Well, I think it's a good point, right? I think, but you know, sure. He says that we retain the right to harm our oppressors. He cannot draw to you the line or give you an example oh, sure. of a We're violent revolution that has only hurt the oppressor and not hurt anyone else in that country. I argue the effects of violent revolution is painful and damaging to all. He even cites Give me some examples, though. You lock, but there's two problems with that. First, Buchanan, on my, on my framework, articulates that lock sidesteps the means and doesn't address what sort of violence would be used to achieve this ends. But secondarily, minority groups that are used in violent revolutionary groups do not reflect the oppressed. We're talking about rebel revolutionary groups, not the people who are actually being oppressed. I don't know about that. Second, he articulates that, that alternatives fail. Yet in the study that he reads, the same author cites that actually violent revolutions are three times more likely to encounter mass killings, meaning the government feels more comfortable using their tools to suppress those sorts of dissidents. That wasn't a response, right? So again, like this is getting to a clash that isn't happening, right? We're saying like, he says that nonviolent protests fail, but violent ones lead to mass killings. Like those aren't inter intersecting with each other, right? They can both be true. And anyway, um, th this is important because if I'm evaluating, like I said, this is a methods debate, right? So if it's a methods debate, I'm not really picking the winner by picking an impact. I'm picking like the impact is justice, right? And so it becomes way more important for me to know which arguments are true, which arguments are valid, which arguments am I considering at the end of the round? And when your response doesn't really clash with the original point and I'm left I'm left believing both things are true, but you're not telling me what's more important because you treated it as though a answered B, but it doesn't. And you're also not giving me any sort of weighing mechanism there, right? And so that is where you get less consistent, less predictable, more arbitrary um, judge decisions. Then he also articulates that we're actually going to only be seeing cosmetic changes and that somehow violent revolution will create some bigger or some 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 solution for the problem he's articulating to you. But I argue that violent revolution incites violent crackdowns from the oppressor. If anything, Carnes cites that violent revolution not only brings on three times more mass killings, but that's because when violent revolutionaries pick up arms, it threatens the status of the regime and they're more willing to use any means necessary to maintain power. That's especially concerning when you extend my Griffin card, who articulates that these governments are willing to use mass amounts of violence, killing hundreds of thousands of people. So either their rebellion is, rebellion is violently squashed, guaranteed 
banking failure or the loss of life is scaled up because now everyone's using bigger guns. I have two examples of this happening. In South Sudan, when the government's heard of violent revolution, they wiped out tens of thousands of people in innocent villages as their crackdown who had never even heard of that violent revolution. That's Mendik in 2018. In Syria, violent revolution was met with a brutal tyrant, barrel bombing cities of millions of people and gassing innocent children, women, and people who lived in the wrong place. These sorts of violent acts is what revolutionaries bring on. But even then, he argues that violence is effective in putting place a respectful regime. But I argue that it's only justifying endless violence. Violent revolution creates an endless cycle of violence by justifying morally abhorrent actions. If anything, revolutionary leaders take power again and use, vi use violence in their rule. Those sorts of things could never be just. Okay, so I think, um, I think the arguments were really good. I think the neg is winning. I think the time management could have been a little bit better so that we didn't have to rush through all of that stuff, right? And suddenly, like, <laughs> you know, Jimmy Wales, creator of Wikipedia, once said, violence, never do it. Like, suddenly those 15 seconds feel more valuable, right? Where just a breath and a gap between two points, letting something sink into your audience's mind, letting them make the connection before you then go on to the next piece of evidence is gonna be really important. And that's not about speed, right? That's about emphasis. Even when debaters are spreading really, really fast, uh, good debaters will do what Paul calls, I don't know, it's probably, he's not the only one, right? But it's um, stop, slow, stop, go. So what that sounds like is, so what about another I'm talking really fast. Blah, 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 blah. So if the, the oppression that you are trying to, or I guess you're going really fast, blah, 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 blah. So if the new government that you are creating got that power, by enacting violence, they will maintain and legitimize that power by maintaining violence. Blah, 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 right? You can go fast again, right? But like, that is really effective emphasis. It's really important for people to process the significance of what you're saying, how it interacts with the other arguments in the round, right? Otherwise, they might hear it for a few seconds, but then when the affirmative comes up and starts making some other points, they might not have that argument in mind and might not process how what they're hearing now interacts with something that they should have been thinking about from five minutes ago. And, and that's the thing. It's not about speed, right? It's about emphasis. Like, are you able to stop and emphasize the thing that matters about this response? If your pace is too consistent, nothing is emphasis. All right. Is everyone ready? Mm -hmm. Let's begin. So let's start on your contention one about how violent revolution allows illegitimate leaders in, right? Yes. So you talk about how violent means lead to violent ends, right? Correct. And then you bring up this Perkowski 18 study, right? No, I read or, to a study from Kim. I'm talking about the study that says that there's three times more likely to be mass killings. That's from Carnes and Chenoweth. That's Carnes and Chenoweth, yes. okay. Where did the sample size from that study come from? It came from a large amount of selections of both violent and nonviolent revolutions. This is the kind of like um, means, like methods debate. Um, like analysis that I was talking about, right? Like, okay, where does your study come from? Um, I, this level of debate is a lot better when the debaters see each other's evidence and can read each other's evidence. And in fact, have had time before the debate to look at the actual evidence because now all that we really get to hear is like, what was the sample size? That doesn't seem good. And it's like, oh, it was good. And you as the judge, like you don't see the evidence or whatever. So you're like, ah, like, was it big? Was it small? Like, I, you don't know, right? So in debates where there's disclosure and um, 
you know, uh, speech docs that are digitally shared with people. Like it is there to facilitate much better clash at this level of the debate. Um, there are ways in which th there are other things that also happen as a result. And some people might not think that that benefit is worth the downsides, but, um, that is the, that is the benefit. That is the goal to make this level of the debate, which in a debate like this at the national final round is a really important question. What does this study actually say? Um, I doubt we're really going to be able to get too far. Let's find out. Okay. What was in the sample? How'd they determine what was included? Um, they basically just chose whether or not they had enough information and then chose and selected violent and nonviolent revolutions. And in those cases, under the study or the specific citation I write, it talks about whether or not a country was willing to use a mass killing against that revolution. Okay, gotcha. So in your worlds, can the oppressed seek any recourse? Yes, I argue they can seek recourse through nonviolent means, okay. but if that fails, it's preferable to leave the country than fight, All because right, so fighting will not only risk your life, so but the rest of the lives okay, in your country. So, so let's talk about nonviolence. Have you provided any holistic statistics to prove that nonviolence works? Right, I'm not saying that nonviolence will always work. I also say that violence will not always work. If anything, violence right. fa receives more violent responses and you, doesn't solve for oppression. But can you I'm saying, yes. Say, oh, don't do that. Don't do that, right? Like, see how the now that the tables are are, are, are are turned and she's answering the question, he's doing a much more effective job of controlling the time and cross-examination, and she's stopping her sentence. She's not even, like, ending the sentence shorter because, because she knows he has a point and then being like, okay, yeah, what's up? She's just stopping mid-sentence. Um, She's winning the debate, but is she, does she look and sound like it, right? Um, and yeah, I think, like, again, a lot of the clash here is about, like, do you prove that this works? Do you prove that this doesn't work? And I think the, where the negative is winning here is exactly what I was talking about earlier, where, look, whether it works or not, like, neither of us have evidence that our our advocacy is better able to stop oppression. All I'm arguing is that in a world where we don't know either way whether oppression will or will not be stopped, we should choose the option that risks innocent people getting hurt, that avoids the risk of innocent people getting hurt. Um, and I think that is what she's trying to explain, and I think that is, like, the story, right? I think that is, like, the thing that the negative needs to get the audience to understand and 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 think about throughout the entire uh debate i think so much of debate is getting your judge to ask the right question to ask themselves the right question as they're making their decision right and i think she's i think the question is there i think the question <laughs> the question is the material for, for, the, for the judge to be asking the question that leads to a negative ballot is there. It's just a question. Of, I keep saying it's just a question of. It's just a matter of um, whether the negative can control the focus of the round in that way. And rhetorical tools stop slow stop go answering questions well in cross-examination like those are your tools for commanding the judge's focus into certain areas even if the judge was flowing perfectly um you you still need to motivate them to choose one of several different ways they have to evaluate the round and um i think a lot of debaters take it for granted that because there is a way in which they win, that is the way the judge will look at the debate. And that's when they decide that that judge is terrible. But that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Like, it, you have to be the one who – you have to be – so much better at debate than you currently are to not to not only see the way that you're winning but all of the ways that 
either side could be winning and then explain to the judge like why they should choose one particular way of looking at the debate. Um, and it's hard for debaters who aren't there yet to understand that. And that's why people tend to become a lot better at debate in their first year of judging than they did in their last two years of competing, right? That, that perspective being on the other side and having to make decisions when the debaters are being really vague and just being in the judge's seat is really, really, really important um, experience. That's why when I'm having my debaters watch around, I always tell them, don't put yourself in the shoes of one of the debaters, right? Debaters will watch a debate round and they will think like, what would I say if I was arguing against this? Or what did they just do that I could do? Um, which are, which are, which are very helpful ways of looking at a debate round, but they're not as helpful and they're not as powerful a learning tool as I am going to watch this round pretending to be the judge and I am going to make a decision. And it's not a question of whether I made a right or wrong decision, as in I made the same decision that judge made. It's just understanding this is a decision that could get made from this round. This judge made this decision. This other judge made this decision. And then can you see patterns of what kinds of judges make what kinds of decisions? And that informs what strategy you utilize going into the round, but most importantly, like during the round, right? Or like good debaters are watching their judges, looking for like nods, eye contact, facial expressions, just anything based on their style of debate that they prefer, their background, what region they're from, to be like, how are you going to approach this debate that's in front of you? And if you can predict that accurately, you are way, 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 way more likely to win. And um, that like round vision is a hard one trait, but the way you get it is, um, by thinking like a judge and by getting a lot of experience judging. You can't get that by just being in your own debate rounds all the time. But can you like provide any holistic statistics to prove that violence or nonviolence will work? Well, well, the statistics I read to you in my second contention says that it's less likely to encounter mass killings. I'm right, not but saying does it overthrow the governments. I'm not specifically saying that it's more successful at that. I'm saying the thing that's most successful is actually fleeing your country and using your power as a diaspora, okay. as a refugee, to make change. So how is an oppressed person supposed to flee the, their country? How is someone stuck in North Korea okay. supposed to flee their country when the government is shooting them at the border? Yeah, so that's a. They do it all the time, bro. I mean, you pick the one example that is the hardest to leave and whatever, it happens. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not telling you that it works all the time. I mean, like she's giving a perfect example. I am an example of that, right? I am the product of the Iranian diaspora trying to use advocacy and political pressure from outside the country to influence change within the country rather than be there and use violence, right? Now, that choice got made for me when I was a child, but it, regardless of whether you think it's effective or just or good, like, it exists, right? How is that possible is not... And also, like, what is the purpose behind asking that question, right? Like, I'm not just criticizing the understanding of the debater. Is like, how does asking that question help you, right? You're just asking your opponent to elaborate on the point that they clearly seem to think is going to win them the debate. Um, in, in law, they have this saying that you should never ask a question you don't know the answer to. I wouldn't quite say that that is as absolute in debate. I think there's a lot of instances where you ask a question where – what the answer is isn't important. What's important is that the other person struggles to answer it. But the fact of the matter is that I, there's no reason to think that this person is struggle, about to struggle, right, uh, to answer this question. It seems like you're just giving them a platform to better explain something that they read in their case, but in a voice and in a demeanor that was, like, way less engaging than 
what she has now. And you're just giving her the platform to, to elevate her best points, which is not how you should be using your cross-examination. Really interesting thought experiment. You cite to me it's hard for people to leave from North Korea. I argue it's easier for them to leave than to find military weapons, train themselves and their friends to overthrow that government and not cause mass chaos in the country. Killer. Congratulations on winning the national championship. <laughs> yeah, like as far as I'm concerned, the debate is over, right? And and like say I'm a judge, like at that point I'd be like, okay, so the neg wins. Um yeah, uh, because, you know, it is points that I've been making and it's arguments that I saw, but now we've confirmed that she sees it. She made the point in a way that is super, super clear and comparative, right? That's the most important thing about this it is directly comparative to uh, her opponent's method. And um, I really don't see how the affirmative is going to get out of this, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, like circle the name on my ballot and finish all my feedback, but um, as a judge, like I, I know very early on which way I'm gonna vote. I'm just waiting for the debate to end so that I know if like that's still how I'm going to do it, right? Um, so what realistically can the affirmative do at this point? Um, like, what's the strategy? How do you dig your way out of this? I think you have to rely really hard on this framework of the only thing that matters. It, like, remember that in the question of, like, defense and offense, right? It doesn't matter what responses the uh, – what responses to the negative the affirmative can come up with, Right? some things will get through and those things seem like they're going to do a lot of damage to his points that we heard in his first speech. It is very difficult. And by difficult, I mean, you really can't make your first speech and your main arguments better in your second speech. They, they have to come out as strong as they're ever going to be. Um, and that is why when, like, I have so much criticism of the first speech and so many thoughts because that is the strongest that argument is ever going to be. And at the end of the debate, we're probably going to be left with a weaker version of that argument because it's been challenged and distracted from and, uh, yeah, just, just a lot of stuff have happened to that argument. But those things don't ever really make the initial argument stronger. So it has to start really, really strong for it to still be like that persuasive in the end. If the argument starts out like, uh, I don't know, or like, I don't really get why this would win a debate round. And then you have to try to like build it up later to show me why it's super important. You're fighting a really big uphill battle. But I think the path to victory for the affirmative here is somehow framing this debate in a way where it's like all we care about is ending oppression and the consequences of that don't matter. My opponent doesn't have any and in fact in cross-examination avoids the question of the propensity for nonviolence to solve for oppression. So all I have to do is show you that there is reason to believe there is a higher propensity for violence to solve oppression than for nonviolence to do it. And I think guerrilla groups are my evidence of that. And any damage to the innocent people that guerrilla groups cause is not within the scope of how we need to evaluate this debate. Even if it was, I think my opponent exaggerates the, like, probability and significance of those things happening. Um, I think that is a way, maybe the way, that the affirmative still stands a chance. And even then, I don't, that doesn't sound that likely for an audience to vote for it, right? Um, and so at this point, I'm expecting the negative to win. But let's see. Okay, so what happened when Refu- oh. So yeah, that is so what brutal. Happens when, what happened when refugees fled Syria? Right. So not I hate have questions we... like that. I hate questions like that. 
what happened at <laughs> to who what what do you mean right like I, yeah and i i also don't like it when the other side is like well let me answer the question i think you're asking like i don't know it's not a question i would be like what do you mean <laughs> like how would it hurt you how would it hurt you to say what do you mean um anyway gained way more international attention but even then right. international groups have started to reflect and notice that issue but when refugees left syria didn't they weren't they forced to go into refugee camps weren't they faced with white nationalism in europe like this is this is now oh this is now um the affirmative trying to like read a turn like gain offense through their response to the negative and be like, actually, there's whatever. One, I don't think this is going to work. Two, just read again. This is not a question. This is an argument. Like the best thing that can happen to a point, like let's say it's your most important point, right? The best thing that can happen to your most important point in the debate is that your opponent doesn't respond to it. Because then it's dropped and it's just considered true. And asking like, like masking it as a question in the debate is the only way to guarantee that the best case scenario of a drop does not happen. It's the only way to guarantee your opponent has a platform and a time and an opportunity to make a direct response to that point. I don't think it's good practice. I think um, I think debaters are really bad at cross-examination. I don't mean these debaters. I think the quality of cross-examination in debate, um, particularly in high school debate, uh, is... Uh, is low and i like my cross-examination video i think you should watch it weren't they faced with a ton of backlash that ended up continuing their cycle of oppression yes but i articulate that their outcome is better than those who died in syria after the violent revolution when their government unleashed chemical weapons onto innocent civilians all due to the revolution okay so let's talk about this idea of innocent deaths are innocent deaths justified in the long term if they can actually stop political oppression? You have yet to give me an example of where innocent okay, deaths have led to outcomes. Let's, let's even talk about if you could, even if you could provide that to me, I would argue that like using 400,000 innocent lives as a bartering chip but, is never something but let's just. Let's talk about a hypothetical. If we can kill some innocent people in the short term to create a less oppressive government, to create a democratic government that doesn't oppress the people, is that justified? Okay. That is like the core, right? That is the core strategy that the affirmative has left to them and is the core strategy kind of behind this case from the beginning, right? I think given that the affirmative should have gone for this a lot more strongly because the only way for this case to win is for you would eventually have to argue it's worth it for innocent people to die. Um, and so you should probably have examples of that, right? Like instead of just a Malcolm X quote, give me an instance where you're like, here is when innocent people died and it was worth it. Um, the question, how to answer the question here now though, is it's a yes or no question. You pick the safest answer available to you, right? So, um, the question is, hypothetically, if we could stop oppression uh, by killing innocent people, should we do it? Um, I would say no. And if my opponent asked me to elaborate, I would, but I would just say, nope. And if I was asked to elaborate, how would I answer that? Uh, I would say, um, that it's a it's the question is the question of the resolution is a system of justice and no system of justice should include the concept of killing people for their own good right that ultimately justice and rights are a question of autonomy and making decisions about other people's lives is always inherently unjust something like that right but 
whatever. That's my analysis. And the, the, the point isn't that this is the correct answer that the negative needs to give. The point is that what the negative needs to avoid is seeming unsure about their answer. Um, trying to avoid answering the question too much. Like, I get it. Like they're saying, you're saying like you're, the premise of your question is false, but it's a hypothetical question, right? Like there's, you're just going to seem like you're dodging it. And I, I, you could still say something like the time to have provided the evidence that this scenario was possible would have been in your first speech or in cross X still say that. But what I want to hear now from this speaker is, uh, as a very firm, Nah, dog, that is not a good thing to do. Let's see if we get it. Again, I don't think you can prove that to me, but if you could prove that it was minimal death, then yes. Ugh. Ugh, why? <laughs> I th why? I think debaters think that, like, man, that question sounded reasonable, and I'm going to sound unreasonable if I disagree and so i don't want to look unreasonable or not smart so i'm just going to say yes right and this is actually a like cross x trick that you can use against beginners all the time is whatever their point is right uh <laughs> like let's say they're talking about how minimum wage is gonna like increasing minimum wage is going to decrease homelessness right one thing you could do in cross-examination is so are you saying that increasing the minimum wage is going to end all homelessness um, or something like, or maybe not all homelessness, but whatever, right? Like, like ask them their question and ask them if they think their impact is really big. Like, do you think your impact is really big? And those debaters will say, like inexperienced debaters will say, N no, I'm not saying that. And they'll start minimizing their own impact. You know who's allowed to say that this wouldn't work? Like, like, or, or that that is worth it? and give reasons, uh, the affirmative, right? Now they don't have to. Like if, if you had said no, the worst thing that your um, opponent could have said was why? And then you come up with a reason or you just say, I don't know, man, I don't, I don't like killing innocent people. But, but now that you have said, oh sure, yeah, there are instances in which killing innocent people would be okay, which, has no scenario in which it helps you in the debate, right? There's no scenario in which that answer helps you in this debate. Um, now the affirmative doesn't have to prove it. Now they don't have to come up with, well, here is why I say it's worth it. And then you get six minutes and prep to come up with how you're going to respond to it, right? Let them make the point and then respond to it. Don't do that work for them. Okay. It's a little cross X seminar for you here, folks. I'm exhausted. This has been like two hours. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, thank you. not on out oh, there uh, I will be rebutting the negative case then defending the affirmative case is everyone ready this is the hardest speech in LD um, and I usually have my decision made by the end of it right um, because in theory you're not hearing any new arguments by the end of this speech and it's a very short speech and so like our points that are You only get one shot at refuting an argument in debate, right? Like, if you don't refute it in the next opportunity you have to refute it, you've missed your chance. And in LD, that's a, 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 that makes the middle speech really difficult because there's 
formats of debate that get bigger in the middle, like speeches get longer, like parliamentary debate. Uh, speeches start six, seven minutes, and then the middle speeches are uh, eight minutes. And at the end, you get these like shorter four or five minute speeches to end things. In Lincoln Douglas, we get really small in the middle, right where you have the most things to say. This is the, the biggest, I guess one word you could, one term you could use for it is like a skill check, right? Where the affirmative, we now know all of the affirmative arguments. We know all of the negative arguments and it's too early for the affirmative to try to focus all of their attention in one place. So it would probably behoove them to make as many extensions on their arguments as they possibly can, as many refutations on the other case as they possibly can, and they have the shortest speech in the round to do that in. So this is the like hardest speech. Um, this speaker is a very slow speaker. Um, I don't think he's going to speed up here, but what I'm looking for then is if he's not going to touch on everything, he needs to be able to like group arguments and basically bring the debate down into a very simple comparison, right? Um, it's a little early for him to do that, but that that's that's his he runs the risk of the negative picking up a drop that is super damning, but th th those are, those are his options. Like his other option is to be fast. Um, and I don't just mean talk very fast, but be very like time efficient, which uh, I think is going to be very challenging, but let's see. Let's begin. The key difference between an affirmative ballot and a negative ballot is that a negative ballot is a vote for no change in the status quo. It's a vote for the oppressed to continue becoming oppressed. That's not true. Like this is a, um, like a buzz phrase that I'm sure he's used many times at the start of this middle speech but this is not a policy round. The status quo includes people being violent. Like, it's not like the status quo is nonviolence and only through the advocacy of the affirmative are we imagining people do become violent. There's violent, in fact, there's mostly violent reactions to oppression in the status quo. So, um, yeah, strong disagree. The affirmative vote is a vote for change. With that, that's like, again, this is why the framing of like, is it a policy resolution or not matters, right? Because only in a policy resolution is the affirmative vote a vote for change. And that is a very compelling point to make. And I'm sure that's why somebody told him to say that at some point and he started saying it and it was successful for him. But this is not a round in which that applies. And I'm assuming the judges understand that, but who knows? Let's move on to my opponent's framework. Let's start on the criterion of maximizing human rights. Two Why? Dude, you got, you got stuff to get through, but okay. Are, like, are you going to argue? I guess it, it, maybe this is where he argues that innocent people dying doesn't matter. Problems. First, you can't have a society that maximizes human rights if it structurally oppresses a group of people. We need to have all interests represented in the government. We need to minimize structural oppression first. He's presuming that, like, ethics is a function of the government and that what we are – again, this is a policy framing. In a policy, there is an actor and an action. And so when we have a value, we are often saying, well, what should that actor prioritize in its decision to make – in its process of making a decision? We're not talking about an actor here. So, like – the response doesn't make sense that like, oh, well, if the government is corrupt, then they're never going to blah, blah, blah. Like the, the, if anything, the actors here are the oppressed, right? And if, yeah, like the actors are the oppressed and the question is, should they be violent or should they not? And in their decision, they should consider whether they will be hurting innocent people around them. Um, 
I think that's a perfectly valid like framing of the round, and I don't think this response is um, speaking to it. Second of all, I outweigh under her framework. Remember that in her world, the oppressed don't have access to this powerful tool of violence, which means that oppression continues indefinitely. In her world, all the rights violations caused by oppressive governments continue indefinitely. That definitely outweighs the small rights violations caused by the deaths of innocent civilians in my world. Okay, I wouldn't call death of innocent civilians a small rights violation. That's just me. Uh, but also, like, now, like, sure, like, this is what I said would have to be the affirmative strategy, but I hope now we hear a lot about the propensity for violence to solve and create societies that are not further violent, right? Like, you know what the negative has said against that story, and now you know you need that story in order to win, so you have have to get to all of the negatives concerns about the propensity for violence to create nonviolent states, right? So let's see what you have. You had some time to prepare. With that, let's move on to the contention one. First, she talks about how violent revolution just leads to chaos and how it doesn't lead to democracy. Two problems. First, Perworski 12, a meta-study from conducted by Duke University, found that it's impossible to say that one variable Wrong answer. Like violent revolution will definitively lead to an undemocratic regime in the future. That looks at the whole body of statistics, not just one statistic like my. You can't say we should commit violence because you don't know that won't fix the problem. Like you, you want, I, like you need more than that. You're the affirmative. You have the burden of proof. Opponent sites. But second of all, even if we can't predict whether violent revolution will lead to a better government, remember that historically there is precedent to support that violent revolutions will lead to democracy. Heger 2012 finds that the, uh, that, the political, that the political factors created by violent revolution actually do contribute or actually have contributed in the past to violent revolutions. Sorry, real quick. That, that, what? Even if we can't predict this, there's evidence to suggest it will happen? How is that not a prediction? What is it adding to your advocacy, to your story, right? What? So th this is where, like, seeing the forest for the trees, round vision, and just knowing what is my story in this debate? What is the one sentence that I'm trying to advocate for? And then everything else is framed around that. That is really important, right? How is it helping your story that the death of innocent people is worth it for you to say the outcome of violence is not predictable? It, especially in a world where you're also going to argue that the outcome is positive, right? Just that argument isn't helping. Now let's move on to her second point under this contention that violent Wait, what? created that was the 2012 whole finds that the uh, that the political that the political factors created by violent revolution actually do contribute or actually have contributed in the past to violent revolutions. Now let's move on to her second point under this contention. What? Factors created by violent revolution. That the, uh, that, the political, that the political factors created by violent revolution actually do contribute or actually have contributed in the past to violent revolutions. I think he misspoke here. I think what he meant to say is that violent revolutions contribute to better governments? Because it sounds like he's saying violent revolutions contributed to violent revolutions, right? Whatever, that's, that's, that's him misspeaking. There's nothing you can do about that. I, I, it's insane to imagine the amount of nervousness that people have when they're up there, right? But, I, but there's things that, like, aren't a question of nerves, right? And one of those things is, do you have a single piece of evidence that corroborates the story that is your entire strategy Right. Like your entire strategy is that the violence is worth it because it can end oppression. Can you give me one example? I mean, I guess you gave me Syrian rebels who have not succeeded and the American revolution. 
I guess, which I would not say created a non-violent, non-oppressive country, right? So I, 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 I don't know. I feel like this is sort of like um, a question of like big picture pre-round strategy, but okay. Now let's move on to our second point under this contention, that violent means result in violent ends. That may sound good, but it's not empirically true. Klopp 2007, a study, found an inverted U relationship between violence and democratization. So what that means is that in the short term, violence may cause instability. This is, that is a very smart sounding sentence to say. And I'm sure when this person moves on to everything else that they have in their lives, which is going to far surpass any amount of uh, success I'm ever likely to have, right? That saying things like there's an inverted U relationship is going to sound dope. But, bro, there is a timer, and you're not using it well. Like, why use a six-second description that you then have to explain in different words instead of just explaining it in the initial words? It may cause suffering, but in the long term, it creates less violence, it creates less instability, and I would say creating a less oppressive government is definitely worth that short-term suffering. And again, like, the entire affirmative strategy here is, well, there's these pieces of evidence that say this, but you don't ever get to see it or know what it says. Like, I don't think that makes for good debate. On to the contention too. She cannot provide you with a single holistic statistic to prove that nonviolence actually works at overthrowing the government. Furthermore, she cold concedes that actually nonviolence would never work without the threat of violence. On the second justification about how people can just run away. Stop. Okay, so this is a classic debate mistake. Um, there. A point is dropped, and that is true, that that point was dropped, that, um, that nonviolence only works through um, – so, so, so there's things that this affirmative speaker is a lot better at. Um, I think the presentation is a lot stronger. There's things that uh, the negative debater is a lot better at. Um, for example, four-step refutation. Four-step refutation is um, – a checklist for how you frame responding to someone. So it's they say, I say, because therefore. They say, uh, this is their point. Um, the reason you say that, like, what is the function of that? Now the judge is looking at their flow or remembering something, or f now they know where to write down or where to mentally file what you're about to say. I say, and that indicates like, I disagree with this or I have a turn on this or whatever, right? You're explaining like what is supposed to happen to this argument, right? It gets thrown out. You agree with it. You use it for your own sake because you explain, you give a warrant for that, right? You justify that. You, you convince the judge now that they know what you want them to do with that argument. You convince them to do that with the argument. And then there's the therefore. And the therefore is the most important part because that indicates wh why this matters. Like, what does this do? How does this interact with their decision at the end of the round, right? The debate isn't scored on points. It's not like, oh, you won seven arguments, your opponent won five, so congratulations, you win, right? At the end of the debate, the judge is going to make one decision, and that one decision is probably going to frame around whatever is the one most important issue in the round. And so you need to be able to explain how this point that you're extending plays a significant role in how the judge needs to make that decision. This is missing the therefore. So the negative speaker is a lot better with the refutations and is a lot better with the therefores, right? Um, we get a lot more like implication level analysis, even from uh, her like... Um, contentions that are just like violence is whatever right like whenever she makes a point she then says which means that this thing is going to happen in the round right like that this is how i want you to think about this round but it, 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 here you just have an extension that's just like my opponent dropped this so that's bad right dropping things that's not good <laughs> you don't want to vote for a klutz right like 
you need to tell me like, okay, they dropped this. He, here's why this wins me the debate. And here is, man, I always have so much stuff to say about this stuff. So here's the question. This is another pause the video um, question. If your opponent has dropped an argument that you have made, how do you know if that argument has the potential to win you the round or not? Pause the video. Welcome back. What was your answer? I can't hear you. The answer is, if you say something in a debate round that if your opponent drops does not help you win the debate round, that argument was a waste of your time to begin with. And you should not have made that argument. This is the biggest difference between good cases and bad cases or like i don't know normal average whatever mean sure like the hallmark of a good case is everything has a function and the debater understands the function of that argument and if you drop anything it can be used to win a debate round um but you'd be surprised how often i see like one team drops an entire contention and the other side doesn't like have any strategy for how that helps them win the debate. What was the point of that contention? Your opponent has essentially completely agreed to the thing that you said and you're not closer to winning the round. Like what? I thought that was the point of making an argument, right? That you hope you get to prove it's true. What was the strategy there? You proved that it was true and it still is doing nothing, right? Which is why people need to be thinking about debate in terms of impacts and how a judge makes a decision. And that, that should be your thought like at every level of the debate. Um, because otherwise you're just wasting your time. And time is your most important commodity in debate. Okay. This is going to be like Avengers Endgame level long, but let's go. Well, when they run away, they go to places like Europe, where they face more oppression, where they face white nationalism. With that, let's move on to the affirmative case. Like, it's unpleasant on the framework, kind of. My opponent right? said... Like, I... <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't think you're going to win the debate with European white nationalism is worse than getting bombed. I think it's bad and it's unfair and it shouldn't happen. I, I don't, I don't. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think this is your winning strategy. And and like I said, right, like, like this, the, you, the your success in this debate de depends on identifying your winning strategy and abandoning everything that isn't that strategy. As that I must show how it will decrease structural oppression. I'm saying that we can't predict what the new government will look like, but we should focus first and foremost on getting rid of existing oppression. Now let's go on to the contention one about self-defense. But again, this is already answered, right? Like, like with the Iran example is perfect, right? <laughs> Not to be biased, but, um, like, the negative has already indicted this idea. Well, maybe the negative didn't even make this analysis, but the, but the potential for it is there, right? Like, we've already indicted this idea of let's just change the government and see what happens. Um, and there's a specific analysis here that the negative hasn't made but has the potential to make in the next round, which is, um, I think, pretty winning. Um which is that the affirmative hasn't like when we're talking about oppression, we don't know what that looks like. Like, in other words, we don't know that that oppression is inherently and always violent. Right. But the negative says that the new government's oppression will be violent because they gained power through violence. And so they're going to use power to maintain their, or use violence to maintain their power. Um, 
And I think that is a really strong turn that means that we are inherently moving towards a more violent form of oppression, which is a disad, right? Is a negative impact, right? Um, but yeah, and again, like this is where you were emphasizing the your winning story, but you're like you allegedly have evidence that violent revolution creates better governments, and you're consistently not saying it, right? Sometimes the affirmative will respond to that criticism with, "Well, I have a study." But we don't even get the name of the study in this part. We just get the, well, well we can't predict it. Like, that's not, that's not good enough, I, I assume, I imagine. We'll see what the judges think. My opponent just makes a ton of responses. But remember, even if you don't buy self-defense, violent revolution is still justified because it mitigates structural oppression. On to the contention, too, where she makes a lot of really key concessions. First of all, she concedes Chenoweth is 17, which tells you that nonviolence isn't going to work in the future. That tells you that the only route to freedom for the oppressed is violence. The only change, the only change in the status quo will result from an affirmative ballot. She Again, that is denying the antecedent. It says nonviolence won't work, and he's saying, therefore, violence is the only thing that will work. You don't have any evidence to suggest that, right? A won't work, therefore the opposite of A will is not a logically valid syllogism. She also concedes my fourth warrant about the threat of violence. Remember what that tells you. Any instance my opponent can provide you about how nonviolence has worked was only because there were violent factions in that movement. We can only create change with violence. On my contention three about how violent revolution is effective, she again reiterates that it will end up with more violence. It'll end up in less and more oppressive governments. She hasn't shown that empirically, and it's impossible to. Furthermore, she concedes all my justifications. Perhaps the most justifica important justification is guerrilla warfare. Remember, when the government is really, really powerful, the only route to escape the oppression of the government is through guerrilla warfare. The only way to overcome that disparity is by using guerrilla warfare. Okay, that's a very lukewarm applause. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so what should the negative be focusing on in this uh, prep time? Um, the entire affirmative strategy is hedging on this evidence that you can't predict the outcome of, like, what a government will look like based on one policy that they will have, right? I think that evidence is so generic. I think that's so, so, so generic that unless that evidence specifically says you cannot predict whether a government becomes violent if it gains power through violence, I'm going to say my evidence that specifically says that is probably preferable because it's very likely that this is one specific instance that your author didn't take into account or didn't mean to imply, right? Like probably wasn't what they were talking about. They were probably like, and again, we can't see this evidence, right? So we don't know what this person's talking about, but that is a, it's just a wildly big, like, force of the universe, right, uh, to be like, it is impossible to know based on one decision, anything about the future of a government. And I feel like that's uh, just too generic. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would put a lot of attention in arguing against that. And with arguing against that, that is the only, like, roadblock in the way of the negative story. The negative story is uh, violent reactions to oppression hurt innocent people and kills a lot of them. We didn't get any answers to that or why that's not important. We only had the negative, the affirmative framing that one time as, like, a small 
thing, but no reason to explain why it's small, no response to like hundreds of thousands of people being like gassed and bombed and killed. Um, I think those are some very damning drops, right? So the only uh, roadblock to that story is that there's some magical reason why your authors cannot know what they claim to know. Um, and, and yeah, I, I just, so you need to answer that. And then you need to uh, emphasize that the affirmative has, okay, so, so, so you need to emphasize what you're weighing, you know, the death of innocent people and the like further escalation of violence and the propensity for this to affect more and more innocent people in the future. Um, I think you present fleeing as a good alternative, and then you have to weigh against what the affirmative is going to go for. Uh, and when you're doing that, you're really, really emphasizing that despite numerous, numerous opportunities to do so, the affirmative refuses to like argue that they have a propensity to solve, right? What I mean is like they refuse to tell you, oh, here is an instance in which violence created a better government. And in fact, not only do they not have an example, they say it's impossible to have an example, right? So um, while they are wrong and it is possible to have an example if it is true, don't let them change their story and come up in the next speech and try to give us new examples of how this helped. And their guerrilla warfare argument is only true to the degree that guerrillas are more able to overthrow a government, but there's no analysis that one, that doesn't hurt innocent people in the process, or that two, the new governments established by guerrilla movements have a lower propensity and not a higher propensity to be oppressive and create violence. Um, their only example of a guerrilla movement is Syria, and they go like, not ISIS, uh, but that hasn't been successful. And yeah, we don't have any examples. Don't let them come up and give one now that I can't make a response. Okay, that is the negative speech that I wanna hear. And when I'm judging, like that is how I'm thinking. Right. I, I, I'm thinking like, what is like, what would my vote, what, what, what are the routes that the affirmative has to victory? What are the routes that the negative has to victory? And what would I need to hear in order to do that? Um, rarely do I hear arguments from debaters that are like, wow, I hadn't considered that. And that is a really good point. Um, but I love it when that happens. But um, normally what happens is, wow, you didn't put nearly as much thought into this as I put into what I would have said in your situation. But a lot of that's experience, right? This is, this is, I have a more years of experience in debate than you are allowed to have as a high school competitor. So um, it's a very high bar, but people do it. Um, our college competitors, like Brenna, she just won the national championship. Um, she was like insanely good in her second year. She started at our college, uh, as a, as a, like a, as a high school student. Um, she was 16. So by the time she was like 18, I think she could have won a national championship in high school. Um, and I think that goes to show like the effect that um, a circuit can have on your skill level and how quickly you improve that debating. I mean, like, look at this, right? This is for a lot of debaters, like their model for like the highest level of debate. And if this is the best debate that you've seen and that you're familiar with, um, it's just a lot, you just, it's just a lot harder to be better than this. Um, and college debate's really cool because everybody's kind of peers and the same age and you just exchange phone numbers and you become friends and you just talk to people, right? It's not this like weird thing where like, I don't know, 
I'm a child that lives in Oklahoma and you live in Florida. Whatever. Um, do college debate. It's, it's really good. <laughs> everyone ready? We will be going negative and then affirmative. I don't like roadmaps in the last You week. would never prefer a world where we violate all rights of others when we say we're doing it for something good. My opponent has the burden to prove to you that not only are we having violent revolution with the intention of overcoming oppression, but that we will legitimately overcome oppression when we throw these nations into chaos. On my value of justice and value criterion of maximizing human rights, my opponent says we only maximize human rights if we don't have structural oppression. But that's the point of my case. When we have violent revolution, we perpetuate structural oppression forever. We never solve for that problem because the people coming in power use structural means of violence to ga gain and maintain that power and will continue to use it in their rule. That doesn't overcome any of these structures that he's claiming to overcome. Even then, he says you ought to weigh the idea that people have a right to violence and that they don't have any other option. Yet then he concedes all of my cards that I read to you at the bottom of my second contention from Koinova that says diasporas and groups of refugees are able to unseat authoritarian regimes without ever picking up a gun. On my first contention, I argue that violent revolution creates illegitimate leaders. He makes two very interesting and contradictory attacks. He first articulates it's impossible for us to use studies to determine whether or not there will be democracy. Yet then his third, con or third attack is that there's actually a study that says that violence doesn't lead to democratization. Force him to choose one of those. Either we're allowed to use statistics to predict democratization or we're not. So don't let him use both of those attacks on the same contention but even then he says no, that's the wrong okay so so far we're doing a really good job right but when there's a contradiction it doesn't uh help much to say like force him to choose because what does that actually mean what is the judge actually doing right what you um what you need to do is you need to like basically force your opponent to choose and the ships kind of sailed on that you had some opportunities to do that and you didn't but uh, but so far, I'm hearing a lot of the right things in the right ways. Are historical examples of where we've overcome oppression and led to rights respecting governments. Make him name those examples. I've read to you six to eight examples of where in South Sudan, Syria, Libya, Iran, all of these countries where we've led to perpetual unfettered oppression and he can't name to you one where we haven't had that outcome. Even then, that's your first voting issue in today's debate, is that the outcomes of revolution are not overcoming structural oppression, they're perpetuating it more. Kim in 16 cites that revolutionary leaders are more likely to commit genocide and politicide. They're more likely to use their So the first half of the argument is fully defensive. This is the actual offense, right? And so this needs to be really emphasized and made clear because I'll, I'll, I'll get to something else in a second, but let's hear how it's emphasized and made clear. Power and continue it on when they're in rulership, and that doesn't un like that doesn't overthrow oppression. See, wrong. Uh, that you're just saying what it doesn't do, right? That is defense. You have an offensive argument. You need to use it as offense. Tell me why it makes things worse, not just what it doesn't do. Tell me what it does do that is bad. What does it mean for oppression to get worse? Um, now, it's hard to make up on the spot. Well, what does it mean for oppression to get worse? I don't know how I explain that, but this is your negative case. In or like that is the winning scenario for your for your negative case. And I anytime you have a case, you need to ask yourself, what does it sound like for this case to win? What does a final speech and, and you should do that for all of your contentions, right? That that's what I do with the, maybe not with like the beginning students I have, right? But when I'm writing a case, right? I'm, I'm asking myself like, what does it sound like for advantage one to win? What does it sound like for advantage two to win? And are they, do they sound different? Ideally they do, right? Um, because that way your opponent can't use the same strategy against both. Um, so yes, I think the framing here on the key offense is 
a little too defensive. I mean, you 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 made the point. You said that it was making things worse, so it is offense. But I would have liked a lot more like impacts, right? Like like for example, um, let's say like in 10% of situations the government is nonviolent and in 10% of situ like like the new government is nonviolent and in 10% of situations the government is more violent than it was before right in other words in a scenario that i believe there's some propensity to solve and there's some propensity for the situation to get worse how do i make that decision then like what is is the new violence or is the increase in violence more bad than the decrease in violence is good if it is you won uh and you need to try to frame that in some way right that makes it the, this is how you win debates more objectively right by by showing yeah um the i don't remember the other thing that i had to say okay on my second contention, I argue that avoiding violent revolution maximizes human rights. He never answers the warrant of my Karns card that cites that violent revolutionaries actually bring on and incite three times more mass killings from their government than nonviolent ones do. That's because a government, when threatened by their rule, is willing to wipe out entire innocent villages like they did in South Sudan. Those sorts of levels of crackdown don't happen with nonviolent protests as commonly, and that's why you prefer it. But even I would like a lot more analysis. Not, not, I mean, not a, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's the right argument. She made it well. I think there's more storytelling that can happen here, right? Like, I think, like, what are we actually talking about? Like, what we're talking about children being murdered. Like, like, get your audience to actually understand the concept of one child being murdered for a political reason. And then get them to try to imagine that being multiplied by the thousands, right? Like, ultimately, impacts are something that are felt. I think we, we like, treat debate as this, like, logic, evidence thing. But, but one, it's not. And two, you're bad at logic and evidence. Like... Not just you, but your format of debate is bad at, like, bro, what? I can't read your study, right? Like, it, it, it's too, the neg is trying to win on me loving their study that, that, uh, that governments become three times more uh, dangerous uh, three times more likely to commit violence or whatever. And the affirmative really wants me to love their study. That's like, you can't predict whatever, bro. I can't, how am I supposed to make that decision? <laughs> like none, you haven't read each other's studies when you're responding to it. You're not explaining the study that well. I haven't read it. Like, how am I supposed to feel confident enough that like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that study's definitely right. And then make my decision based on that. Like ultimately, judges who are doing that aren't really making their decision on this evidence. So they're using feelings that they maybe aren't aware of, maybe are aware of, maybe they're good, like valid feelings. Maybe they're, I don't know, shitty feelings about like bias and, 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 and yeah, like, like your judge is going to be feeling feelings anyway, right? Like don't, don't be a coward. Like, you're. T don't be a coward. You're talking about children dying. Talk about it, right? I I don't know. Like, don't sanitize your own impacts and well and and whatever. They're 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 children themselves. So, and that sounds I don't know. I'm not saying be traumatic and like. <laughs> scar everybody in the audience right but i don't know i think it's i don't think it's good that we talk about these issues in debate and just treat it like a sentence 
Like these are problems that happen in the real world. And I think people would have a lot lower propensity to say things on a national stage. Like some innocent people are going to be killed, but the evidence suggests we won't know if that's worth it, <laughs> but let's try it anyway. Right. I think people have a lower propensity to do that in a world where honestly, in a world where these kids have to watch interp rounds sometimes, right? Like, Speech and debate is all about advocacy. It's all about different methods of advocating for the same thing. Except a high school interp doesn't do that so well a lot of the time. Um, sometimes it does. But sometimes they're just like, wouldn't it be funny if you... <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if you had a really silly soccer team? Um but usually, right, the idea is that, okay, instead of, like, reading you statistics and evidence to try to persuade you why we should change, like, have reform on immigration, um, let me perform a piece of what it's like to be in the back of a coyote's truck as it's moving across the border, and you realize they're not taking you across the border. They're taking you to a ditch where they're going to, like, hurt you. Um, like, those things are also true in the debate world. Like, we're d discussing the same world. And I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I think we don't do justice to the issues that we talk about. And if we're not able to talk about them in a way that does them justice, should we be having children talk about these things? Because I think what it does is it creates a lot of, I don't know, a lot of young Republicans who are like, yeah, you know, that is bad, but not, not bad in the same way that taxes are bad. Even then, he attacks my right to flee point by saying that it's not okay for us to put the burden on people to flee their country. That's simply not right. I articulate to you that A, the burden of fighting a violent revolution, putting your life at risk and hundreds of thousands of people in your nation is much higher than the burden or risk of fleeing your country. If anything, fleeing your country is things that also happens after a violent revolution, as he's pointed out to you. You prefer my evidence because Coinova cites that diasporas give them political leverage they didn't have before that allows them to free their, flee their country and create change. That's more than what actually happens when a revolutionary rebel group consolidates power, doesn't listen to the rights of the oppressed, and puts in place another oppressive regime. My only note there is if, if you're winning, and you are, right, you just, you want to sound like you're winning, and you always want to make the, the decision sound simple, right? Like, you want to control what question the judge is asking themselves, and how they decide that question, and then you want to present to them, well, here are the facts, so I think the only conclusion you could draw is this, right? If you make the debate sound big and sound like there's all sorts of moving parts that don't intersect with each other and that there isn't one overall theme, you run the risk of the judge sort of making their own decision based on some factor you have no say in, rather than focusing it around one question of like, look, all I'm asking you is whether you believe blank. If you, if you don't, vote for my opponent. But if you do, here is why you must vote for me, right? And if you control where the judge is looking and what question they're asking themselves, you're a lot more likely to get consistency among a wide variety of judges rather than, and I don't just mean like in terms of lay judge or experienced judge or like a progressive judge, right? I just mean like human to human, right? Different people have heard and absorbed and cared about and resonated with different parts of the debate. But if you can focus the debate on one central question and explain how a yes answer to that question must mean a vote for you, it is very unlikely that you're going to get three completely, uh, unrelated decisions. On to his case, on his value of justice and by a criterion of minimizing structural oppression, I made two attacks that he didn't really answer. First, I argued that violent revolutions only create new, more oppressive regimes. He doesn't answer that point. He says we can't predict the outcomes, yet I've given you the prediction. Every single time we've had a violent revolution in the last 50 years, it has led to a state of anarchy and chaos, and then another violent leadership, potentially even terrorist group, isolating their power to perpetuate those problems more. But I would have even said, like, like ISIS. But um, yeah, it, the, the term we use for that is the links have been tested. You don't need to know that, but now you do. 
The second answer that I made was he has to show to you at what cost. Uh, also, I think one of the first videos we made is like a two minute video that's like using precedence as evidence. This is a great example of using precedence as evidence, right? Like we, n evidence never exists of the future. That's not how evidence is written. No studies ever like, here's what will happen. But I think the safest assumption about outcomes is that it's going to resemble things that have already happened. Cost. Are we willing to have this cause? I articulate to you that revolutionaries in South Sudan use things like sexual coercion and rape, child slaves, killing hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. Are those means justified? You didn't argue that. You brought that up in cross-examination. You might have argued it a little bit, but like, I forgot. And I'm the one saying you should talk about these things, right? I think had you made that a clearer and bigger part of your case, it's less likely that your opponent would have tried to go for the like worth it argument. But yeah, this is the right strategy. If we say it's simply overcoming structural oppression, that's your second voting issue in today's debate. It's that my opponent's conception of justice says that overcoming oppression has no moral fundamental rules. We can just do anything we want as long as we're hopefully overcoming oppression. Pair that with the fact that he can't prove to you that we'll overcome oppression, and you've got a dangerous level or uh, conception of justice that I'm not willing to accept. Even then, on his first contention, he says that people retain the right to hurt others. He drops all three answers I make on this contention. First, I say that he can't contain by violence against just the oppressor. The right to self-defense says it's okay to kill your oppressor. It doesn't say it's okay to destroy your nation and kill hundreds of thousands of people in that country. I additionally cite this that Buchanan new, argues that argument. Locke not only sidesteps the means, allowing any violent justification to happen, but also, and most importantly, I articulate to you that violent revolutions are led by minority rebel groups, not by the oppressed. Those people are more likely to put in place structural oppression and perpetuate violence. You're never solving for these issues if you say that violence solves the problem. That's what Finlay in 09 in my case articulates. If you want to break the structures of this oppression, you have to make a break with coercion at the beginning. Using coercion to end a, co a coercion only leads to a cycle of violence. Additionally, on his second contention, he says all alternatives fail. I feel and so I never bad. She's doing so good. She's doing so good, and she's clearly so nervous. And I, I just feel for her, you know? I don't, I don't know who her like coach and friends are but I, I hope they went up to her right after this and told her that she did a really good job um and she did yeah it, it's just like she's doing such a good job that you wish she was enjoying it more with card, but I proved to you that Chenoweth specifically cites that nonviolence is less likely to encounter mass killings. But even then, he doesn't give you an example of a successful violent revolution, something that you infinitely support. Infinite. Then he also doesn't answer <laughs> either say of my stuff two main attacks <laughs> on his second and third contention. I argue that we see issues of crackdown, where governments are willing to go into innocent villages, kill more people, and commit more oppression when we start violence. He has the burden to prove to you that that's just, but additionally has the burden to prove to you that endless violence by the revolutionaries is okay. That's your third and final voting issue. My opponent will say in his next speech that guerrilla warfare is good or that it will solve for all of these problems, but I articulate to you that that's what leads to more violent consolidated, consolidated rule, more oppression. If anything, you prefer my evidence about diaspora that proves to you we've been able to unseat authoritarian regimes, but even then, if you don't buy that, it doesn't throw your state into um, endless chaos and sheer anarchy. Thank you. Great. Good job. Is there a path to victory for the affirmative here? No. Not, I mean, not in my book. Like, I think at the point where, like, especially, like, the, the points about sexual violence and whatever have, have come up, I mean, that was always the point, right? And, like, that was always what the affirmative would have had to try to hand wave and excuse, right? And, 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 and imply that there was an acceptable amount of. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think they just didn't give themselves enough options out of the gate to get around that. Um, or like... They, they never, like, 
like, I don't know, in Iran, like all of that stuff is happening as a form of oppression, like in prisons and whatever, like to like political prisoners and protesters and stuff like that. Right. So like you could argue, no, like <laughs> these people should be violent against their attackers. Um, but you haven't on the affirmative. I mean, I don't think there's coming back. Like, I don't know what you're writing. <laughs> you're like, uh... uh, sometimes when I was debating, I would just, I would just scribble. I just, I just would just scribble lines. Like I wouldn't be writing anything. I just wanted to look like I was writing something or I wanted to just give my permission, give myself permission to just sit there and think. And I feel like if you just sit there and you just think it's going to look bad, especially in Parley, like Parley didn't have prep time. I was doing this. While <laughs> I was doing this while my opponent was speaking. I just wasn't flowing what they were saying. And I was just pretending to be flowing. So I could just sit there and just think like, what the hell am I going to do? Uh, I will be going over framework and key voting issues. Is everyone ready? Framework. Well, let's begin. You have on the to, framework, though. we essentially agree on the principle. We should try to do what protects the oppressed and what creates a change for the better of the status quo. So with that, it's too let's bad move on to that we have no issues. way of knowing. My first key voting issue evidence, is that nonviolence is not an effective if a method tool. Will do that. She tries to say that in the negative world, we can have it all. We can prevent innocent deaths and we can create revolution. But that is not what the negative world is. In the negative world, nonviolence does not create any change for a couple reasons. First of all, she can't provide you with any statistics of nonviolence actually working. Second mm. of all, I, I provide you with the warrants mm. that nonviolence won't work in the future because regimes are becoming savvier at dealing with the techniques of these nonviolent protests. That's a point she concedes. I also provide you with Channel 2017, which empirically. So, as a judge, right, like the way I'm processing this is. Can I vote for the affirmative here and do I, or sorry, the negative here? Can I vote for the negative here and do I need to vote for the negative here? And I will only process whether I can when I know if I need to. So, for example, he says, look, she has no way of proving to you that violence can, uh, I'm sorry, that nonviolence is a viable way of creating change. I am willing to grant that to him for now or just not care about it for now because the negative has another path to victory. And that path is that even if that like even if nonviolence doesn't create change, at least it doesn't triple the amount of violence happening towards whatever, right? If he answers that argument, I will because that is the argument that I either of those arguments I think probably mm, I like the the triple the violence argument more, right? So once that's not available to me, now that I have identified it as my favorite argument in the round, the one that I think is the most significant and is controlling my decision in the debate, if I don't have the option to vote for that, I will consider the next argument down. Um, normally, I'm, I'm doing this looking at the affirmative, right? Uh, one thing that the negative didn't say that they should have, and you remember earlier when I was like, what was I going to say? It was this, that um, the negative doesn't have a burden of proof. The negative can say, we don't know if violence is justified or not. And so vote negative on presumption. Now, people aren't trying to like win on presumption, uh, but they should. You can do it. Happens all the time. Paul did it all the time. Um, I, I, I think it's a really valid argument to say, look, if you're not sure how to vote in this debate, that is an indication that the affirmative has not proven to you that the resolution is true. And that is literally their job. Um, so anyway, um, 
yeah, so I'm hearing that argument. Am I really processing it? I think there's ways in which I can be like, no, no, no. I think the negatives analysis on the propensity for blah, blah, blah to solve is sufficient because there's evidence and now we don't have statistics, but there is analysis from this study. And I don't know that the study is perfect, but I feel like enough of it is conceded. Like I can imagine myself making that decision and I know like I'm paused and I, I could, whatever, but I'm not doing that work in my head, right? I'm just waiting for my favorite, most important argument to come out, to like come up. And if he comes up and he takes it out, then I will worry about what to do next. But if it comes up and I still like that argument, or if it doesn't come up, then I will be like, that is where the negative wins. Does the affirmative have any surprises or anything that beats that? But I, I don't need to worry about how to resolve a negative argument, a negative contention that is not the most important one, right? Because I only need one reason for the negative to win. So I have picked my one reason for the negative to win. I will then hear out whatever the affirmative has, but if it doesn't beat the one reason the negative wins, I write a really clear, really simple ballot that says the negative wins. This is what I think is the most important argument in the round. Here's why I think it's the most important argument in the round. Here's why I think the negative wins that argument. Good job, here's your feedback. He tells you that nonviolent revolutions are not working anymore. She responds by just saying that, well, Chenwa says that mass killings increase when we choose violence. Right, but that's non-responsive to my Chenwa card. Yeah, Remember, it's non-responsive because non it's not defense, it's not offense. will not let the oppressed escape their oppressors. Let's move on to the but second But violence makes issue, it three times worse. And that's worse. that violent revolution works. It first works in the sense that it overthrows governments. Remember my conceded point about guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare allows the people to overthrow governments that are significantly more powerful than them. Like now, my opponent what? got up in her last speech, and she came and said that, well, at what cost? At what cost are we overthrowing these governments? We're killing innocent people. But remember the weighing analysis I provide you that she concedes. When we choose violence, we get rid of at least the status quo oppression. We create a chance for a better government. When we negate, yeah. we don't yeah. give any chance for the oppressed. The current oppression, the current Except rights violations continue indefinitely. That's the most the important analysis of this debate. If she wants to talk about argument. rights, then let's consider that rights violations continue indefinitely in her world. At least in my world, we can try to change the world for the better. Now, she also says that violence leads to more violence, but she... Yeah, it's not even a drop because he's responded to it, but, but the cleanest impact. And what do I mean by the cleanest impact? That's the one that requires the least work for me to say, I believe this happens, right? Like, if I'm explaining to this guy why I believe the impact happens, he can't be like, well, what did you feel about this response I made, right? And the cleanest impact for me is that um, violent, like, responses to governments triples the amount of, like, uh, like civilian targeting campaigns of violence, right? He brought it up. It's not dropped, but he doesn't argue in any way that that number doesn't triple. So that is the cleanest impact. Every, every other impact, he has something to say about it. And I can resolve that. I can be like, well, here is actually what the negative said that I like more than what you're saying now. But that's work. And I am looking for the cleanest place that I can vote. But she concedes the actual holistic evidence I provide, CLOP 2007, which tells you that in the long term, violence decreases as a result of violent revolution. That's really important because that tells you that in the long term, violent revolution does create better governments or it does actually create better societies that don't have as many innocent people dying. Remember, the round is going to go down like this. If we want to value rights, if we care about the oppressed, if we want to get rid of oppression, we have to affirm. In the negative world, the oppressed have no recourse. They cannot get rid of the governments. A vote for the negative is a vote for a hopeless world. A vote for the affirmative is a vote for a chance at change. For those reasons, I affirm. Okay, now I know what he was writing. <laughs> he was writing that, right?
I think he's a really, really, really good speaker. I think it's a low point win for the neg. For me, there's no points in out rounds. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, they're both very, very talented. Good debate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I explained my decision uh, well enough. Uh, are they going to announce here? Let's end finalists. Blake, coached by Tony. Nahas. What's happening? On the affirmative, you had Nahas Shigal Rupati from University School in Ohio. He by doesn't James look Lewis, like that Peter was Pack, correct. And Matt Sleskak. Bro, this... You have all day to look at this piece of paper and ask someone, hey man, how do I say this name? And representing the negative, Grace Johannes from Liberty Senior High School in Missouri, coached by Tim Baldwin. Yeah, those names you got right. White people. Always conspiring Are together to say each other's names, right? Are either both of you right? non-seniors? I'm sorry, what? He's coming back! That's nice. Well, he's probably graduated now. Congratulations on auto-qualification to next year's national tournament. What? Oh. Oh, okay, it doesn't say, but yeah, okay, Grace won. Hey, congratulations, Grace Johannes. And uh, yeah, good round. And um, if you have other requests for other rounds, let me know. Oh my God, my hair is like, it's like, it's, it's, it's 1.30 in the morning, folks. Okay, um, I hope, you, you're, you're over here. I hope you. <laughs> there it is. I analyzed. I'm always like, why don't we do more of these? Like, so many people watch. And then it's, like, three hours. Um, but I like that round, and I feel like we talked about stuff that was more interesting to me. I don't know. I like all the rounds we watch. Everyone is very talented. Good good job, children.